People say mafia killed Kennedy. I have no doubts that some of the trigger men might have been mob connected, but who could make all this happen? Because the cover-up's even more important than the assassination itself. The FBI came in and were pushing doctors and nurses away to, to get, get a hold of the body. body. To get the body, they chip it out immediately. Immediately, as we would see in the autopsy later. They had to do some things there. Oswald's version is that he puts together that he's been set up. Yes. Then when he's leaving, they video him. Have you been way aware that you're the suspect for shooting the president of the United States of America? And he tells the whole world, I'm a patsy, meaning I'm the fall guy. We've had witnesses that saw the assassination. 48 hours later, they're dead. And word has trickled out that this assassination, Lee Harvey Oswald, may not have been the shooter. So he's got to put that to bed. <laughs> the scary thing, Matt, is this is 1960s America. We already know with JFK's murder, if you tell any other story, you're dead. Right. I mean, dozens of witnesses to John F. Kennedy's assassination. One guy car flipped over. One guy in perfect health died of a heart attack. One guy suicided himself, you know. The, just astronomical odds of people that witness the same event end up dying within 48 hours. Right. It just doesn't happen. What about the Secret Service agent that just recently came out with a book? Well, he's, he basically said that... Hey, this is Matt Cox, and I am here with Dave Wheelhauser. Now... I'm going to say we're going to be talking about the assassination of President Kennedy. And do you want to do are we going to do uh, Robert Kennedy? Yeah, also? We'll talk a little, a little bit about bit? Robert because okay. it, it ties into it. All right. Now, I'm going to say Dave said I'm I'm no expert, but Dave's read over well over 100 books on the uh, on the assassination. And he's done a ton of research. And in my opinion, since there is no expert license i feel like he's definitely an expert and so we're gonna we're gonna be talking about that we're also going to talk a little bit about the new book that's come out by a former secret service agent uh, and it's called final witness we're going to talk about uh dave's take on the book and uh his, and the secret service agents theories i mean obviously you've been on before right but uh, i was talking to uh i was talking to my wife and I was explaining last night. Yeah. 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 You know, uh, the Kennedy assassination. We are, we are having this discussion and she goes, yeah, but he's been on before. How are you going to introduce him? And I thought, and I said, he's an expert. And she, she goes, does he think he's an expert? And I said, of course, he's got to think he's an expert. <laughs> I said, he's read over a hundred some odd books on, on the subject. He's been, he's been, uh, he's been re uh, researching it for fucking 20 something, 30 I years. Want, honest to God, I wanted to write a book on it. I just didn't see where my, what lane my book, because there's other people right. that. Well, I'm saying, and then we sat down and you said, well, listen, I'm no expert. What are you <laughs> talking about? Like, what makes you an expert? Doing a thorough amount of research on a yeah. subject makes you an expert. Hell, you said you even have a. A mock-up of the, uh, is it the gun or a, in the of the car or? Oh, I was going to show you how a man like the Carcano, how the magazine uh, ejects just by using my gun. So oh, okay. That, that was basically how it was. Now, we can pull up a picture of that later if you want and people can see. Right. But, but we, that was part of the evidence that they really botched when they left it at the, uh, in the sniper's nest. But first, let me tell you about today's sponsor, Aura. Aura can identify data brokers exposing your info and submit opt-out requests on your behalf. Brokers are legally required to remove your information if you ask them, but they make it super hard to do it. You can try Aura free for two weeks using my link. Aura also does so much more to protect you and your family from online threats that you can't see. It's really easy to set up, so you don't have to download several different apps to get things like parental controls, password management, identity theft insurance, and more. You get everything at one affordable price. Let Aura do the hard work of keeping you safe online so you can focus on other tasks with peace of mind. You can either let people continue to profit off of you and your private information, or you can go to Aura.com backslash Matt to start your two-week free trial 
also linked in the description below. Okay. Uh, let me just tell you why I got so involved in this. Okay, perfect. Back in the mid 80s, grandma, my aunt and I went to Bush Gardens and we're driving back kind of through Florida back down to Boca Raton. And we started talking about UFOs and then the Kennedy assassination. And they kind of opened my eyes to, oh, wow. And then they told me about the Zapruder film and whatnot. And then would, wouldn't be two years later, I'm working at the Governor's Club in West Palm Beach, which is right across from Palm Beach, where the Kennedys have their compound. And I've got the I'm book, sorry, The old, Men Who Killed Kennedy. How old were you again? 19 years old. Uh, okay, sorry. The Men Who Killed Kennedy. And it's after my shift. And I set my book down. And I'm just waiting to get my check. And who walks in but Ted Kennedy? Now, I'd seen him in the grill a few times, but he's like, hey, can you get me a martini? All right. I was like, sure, Mr. Kennedy. What you reading? And I was like, oh, <laughs> no. Lord, fuck the read. <laughs> but he was like, he was so cool. And he encouraged me to read more because I want to go, who did it? Right. And he was like, keep reading, kid. Keep reading. And that Boston accent. And so I would see him. You know, I worked in the town of Palm Beach for the, you know, for the next four or five years, valeting, doing a lot of bartending, waiting tables. And uh, he wouldn't know my name, but he recognized my face and say, you still reading? And uh, I think he knows who murdered his two brothers, but he's probably in fear for his own life. Right. Because if they can kill them, they can certainly kill him. And now they quashed his political career with the whole Chappaquiddick thing. But that's another story. So that's what kind of got me started on this. And I read Dr. Charles Crenshaw's book. I read some crazy books with outlandish theories that are like this, like the limo driver turned around and shot him. Yeah. Not true. So I've read a lot of books and I'm very passionate about this subject. So, right. Well, anybody who's anybody who's even remotely associated with the event mm. wrote a book. Right. You know, it was like it was such a, a, a cash grab, like, yeah, uh, to to be even close to that. And and that was that was when people read. Sure. You come up with a book and you could you could you know, make a ton of money. Right. On just book sales. Like almost nobody's making a ton of money in book right. sales anymore. But. So let's start. Let's start back with the when Kennedy took office. One of the things that Dwight Eisenhower said on the way out is beware of the military industrial complex. And that's basically the war machine and all that comes with it. The politicos in Washington that make money off it now. And what he was worried about, we see today. You have candidates that are spending two, three million dollars to get a job in Washington to make that pays one hundred and forty thousand dollars. Right. All right. Why? Because you're selling influence yeah. to McDonnell Douglas and uh, gun manufacturers and Texas Instruments and computer company, anything you can. That's why these jobs, people stay on them for a long time. They make a lot of money. So war is great for the economy. Right. And he and. Eisenhower was worried he could see maybe he was thinking about Vietnam. The French were in the Vietnam and we had sent CIA and advisors to Vietnam and Kennedy wanted to stay out of the war. Right. So, so well, let, let, let's first mention that Kennedy, Kennedy had, was in World War II. Yes. Right? Um, he was what, in charge of like a, a, a he was in the Navy. He was in charge of a. Um, I don't know. He know he's, he boat? heard it. He hurt his back right. in a boating accident. Right, and he had actually uh, helped save someone or something. Right, he'd gotten under war. So he was kind of like a war hero. Right, not kind of like he was a war hero. Right, maybe not. He may not have saved fifteen people. Right, but um, so he he then become then he enters the political arena and eventually runs for president. And Eisenhower was. Did he beat Eisenhower? No, he he beat Richard Nixon. Eisenhower okay, right. was a two-term guy that was leaving office. That's right, because Richard Nixon, and Richard Nixon he started sweating and everything during yeah, the debate. And right. He looked bad. Yeah, and, and uh, the the rumor has it is that Joe Kennedy, Jack and Bobby and Ted's father did a deal with the mob to get a hundred thousand votes in Chicago, and so it's believed that a hundred thousand people, dead people, voted for Kennedy. In Chicago. And that would affect Nixon so much that 12 years later, he would send burglars into the Watergate Hotel to figure out what the Democratic Party is doing. I, I truly believe it affected Nixon terrible because if you take those votes out, Nixon wins the 60 election and we're not having this conversation. But that's another story. 
But this is very important. Joe Kennedy was in league with the mob. Now, remember, he was a moonshiner or, or a bootlegger back in the Prohibition days. And who okay. sold his booze? The mob did. Right. And the speakeasies. And so he had a relationship there. Now, when John F. Kennedy becomes president, his brother is the attorney general. He's the head of justice. And Bobby goes after the mafia. And this right. is very important to the story. And in fact, J. Edgar Hoover, who was the head of the FBI at the time, he wouldn't even say the word mafia. Right. It wasn't even the lexicon. People knew it existed. Like people that knew lived in New York, they're making monthly payments for protection rackets. But nobody says the word mafia. And Bobby was trying to expose this and expose the mafia. And and Matt, I don't know if his dad didn't say, hey, son, you, you Right, right. You know, yeah. I, I, made they helped, I made a deal. They here. helped your brother get an office, right. you know. And I'm sure the mafia feels like, felt yeah, like, you hey, owe we, us big we, time. We helped get, elect you. Absolutely. We were hoping that you were back off, you know, uh, um, as a, you know, as a quid pro quo. Quid pro quo, for sure. So then people say, yeah, so the mafia killed Kennedy. I have no doubts that some of the trigger men might have been mob connected, but. They weren't the ones that could pull all the strings and strings. And we'll get to that. But, you know, people think it's the CIA, it's the mafia, it's the Russians because we had the Cuban Missile Crisis. Of course, we had the Bay of Pigs yes, fiasco yes. where the Kennedys were supposed to provide air cover for the Cubans and the, and the CIA guys that hit the beach. And then right. that blew up in their face. Yeah. Well, and they didn't. And they did. They didn't. They were. They. They were, The agreement was with the Cubans. Well, with the um, what was the name of the unit? They called it the fifty or five five forty two or so. I forget what it was. But the unit that landed, they they had an agreement with the Americans. Like all you have to do is get a beachhead. Yep. You, as soon as you get a hold of a beachhead, we'll send in. Um, we'll send in support. We'll send in uh, air support. We'll send in everything. And they actually got a hold of it, held it for three days. And the Kennedys never sent anything. Never sent anything. And he created enemies in the military with the generals, the Joint Chiefs, and the CIA. Right. And it got so bad that he ended up firing Alan Dulles. And that name will come back in the story later on. And if you're wondering about Dulles, yes, it's the same Dulles that the airport's named after in Washington, DC. Right. So Kennedy had made some enemies in this time. And he had put Lynn Baines Johnson on his ticket because he needed to carry Texas. Still to this day in the South, Texas and Florida are the two big states you wanna win. If you're gonna win the election, right. You need to win at least one of them. You want to win both of them because Nixon had a lot of popularity and being from California, he was going to get California. So it's very important that he take Texas. And to be honest, even though they're both Democrats, JFK and LBJ, they, they didn't really agree on anything and they were not friendly. Right. And after the election, that divide only got worse and worse. And LBJ is a, is a funny businessman. I was reading stories about him back in the 50s and 60s in political career. Now, he was a Senate majority leader, and he was a major power broker in Washington. LBJ knows where all the bodies are buried. In fact, if you want to do deals with him, there's a funny story. I think his wife owned a, well, he actually owned it, but he put it in his wife's name, a radio station in South Carolina. Right. And if you want to do this deal with me, you're going to buy advertisements, and you're going to say, but I'm in Austin, Texas, and I don't care, boy. You're going to do buy advertisements from my radio station. That way, it was clean money. Right. He'd had a lot of shenanigans, and we could go on for hours about LBJ, but he was pretty, pretty dirty. His own attorneys have said, have come out since he's died, that they attorney client privilege that he was knew or took part in five murders. One was his sister, and the other was John F. Kennedy. So LBJ uh, literally knew where some of the bodies are buried. So after the Bay of Pigs, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, LBJ obviously is going to side. He wants to take control of the Democratic Party. The Kennedys do not get along with him, and there's a serious problem. So 
in late 62, Bobby Kennedy starts talking to Life Magazine. Now, Colby won't know what Life Magazine is, but we remember it when we were kids. Time Life is the company. Now, Time Magazine still exists, but there used to be Life Magazine, and it was a weekly periodical with big picture in front, and they they're basically news stories in there. And there was a man named Bobby Baker. Now, Bobby was known as Lyndon's boy. If you wanted anything done with Lyndon Baines Johnson in Washington, you went to Bobby. Right. Because that was Lyndon's boy. And he would say, yeah, I can get that done for you or go fly a kite. Well, the political corruption, like we were talking about earlier, was so bad. And, you know, you scratch my back, I scratch yours, that Bobby talked to Life Magazine and started feeding them the Bobby Baker story about political corruption. And it was going to be a six-part series. And it was basically going to say, in all, all the center of all this corruption is LBJ. And they were going to kick him off the 64 ticket. Right. They did not want any part of him. And I've heard people talk, and Lyndon could be awful to people like I, I one was, of his i was just gonna say i i had always heard like he is foul mouth oh terrible rude j- just just was he was the opposite he wasn't completely unpolished he was a bully which a we total was a completely bully. different he then. would sit with his cabinet in the hot tub naked and he would make fun of other guys and you know in life there's two types of men you're either a shower or you're a grower right and apparently Lyndon was a shower but he would make fun of other people in the hot tub i've heard this before, yeah, by the way like it's it, terrible and and he would throw parties at his ranch and other people's wives would take a nap and Lyndon would get in bed and say move over for the president and sleep with their wives now some wives kicked them out and this is not me saying this is all on record, by the way. So he can, was he was a an sob right, Lyndon can Baines I Johnson. Mention some I I read so in, in I want to say I want to say it was a late two thousands. Mm-hmm. Uh, I could be wrong. The one of Kennedy's chiefs of staff or some whatever somebody that was on his staff wrote wrote a book, and in the book he mentions about um about john f kennedy having an affair with multiple women but one of them was a um an intern Mm -hmm. and he never mentions her name but the press very quickly puts it together with freedom of information act they figured out boom 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 this is the chick they then go to her house like one day she opens a door boom filled with press and she ends up writing a memoir, very short memoir, but it was great. It was great. I mean, probably it's probably a hundred pages, and probably one of the best memoirs I've read. Mm-hmm. And she talks about the affair that she had with Kennedy. She also talks about how Kennedy literally um, was willing to pass her around. So she's like nineteen years. She's like nineteen years old. This guy's forty five years old or forty three, whatever mm-hmm. he was, and he was having sex with her. And at one point, they were there was a some stressful situation was going on. And one of the guys like Bobby was upset and he go, and he says to her, look how anxious he is. Look how upset he is. He goes, why don't you go over and, and, you know, like basically blow him and, and help him relax. And she says, and to be honest, she said, I, I was, I was going to do that. Like, and she had done it before, like when he'd asked her to, and she gets up and Bobby's like, what are you doing? Like he gets all pissed off and he's like, what are you doing? Are you insane? You know, we're, we're in the middle of this and you're pulling this. Like, what are you doing? He gets upset and walks off, but it's not unheard of. Like now, you know, you, you look back on those black and white photos and you think everybody is so put together and perfect and nice. But the truth is they were uh, the only difference in sixties. The British right. had, the British had parliamentary sex scandals. Right. Well, the, only, the UK, one of the huge differences then and now is the press gave them a huge pass. Yes. Like literally this girl would show up, walk around and they would see her. And they would be like, oh, they liked Kennedy. They're not going to say anything. They understand this is this girl. She's here. What she's here for. What's going on. Why she's always around in the background. They know what's happening. They've heard the rumors. They don't say anything. They like him. It's Camelot. You give them a pass. And a lot of stuff was off limits. Absolutely. Nothing's off limits now. I agree. But, and really? you're so right. Mickey Mantle had Breakfast of Champions. It would be a little bit of little Tia Maria and Bailey's 
and his coffee. And that was his breakfast. At, and the press would be sitting right there. Right. So he's and they basically, knew he had a drinking problem. Right. He's but it was Mickey up. Mantle. Right. He didn't say anything about that. They had, there was so much more respect given from the pe- press back then. Now it's, hey, they'll burn your source to get a story out. Right. So anyway, getting back to Bobby Baker, a couple stories had come out. And, you know, Lyndon obviously was not happy. And because he knows he knows he's not going to be on the ticket, he's not going to be on the ticket. And oh, I know what the story I want to say. So Lyndon had a cabinet member. This was later on, but had a cabinet member said, Lyndon, I'm going to resign. I'm going to go be a professor at Georgetown. He said, no, you're not. He said, I heard this. You're going to pull this crap on me yesterday. I got you set. You're going to go to the front line and fight in Vietnam. He's like, I'm too old. No, nope. I got it worked out. You're going to Vietnam tomorrow. Boom. Pack your stuff. He made him stay and be working his cap. I forget the guy's name. I'll get the, I can get the name. And that's how ruthless he was. Right. You don't quit on Lyndon Maines Johnson. Right. He wanted to get a nice cushy professor job. Nope. Not going to happen. And but he could also play the, oh, why Bobby Kennedy would come at him like, Bobby, why are you picking on me, Bobby? You know, play that, oh, poor me, Lyndon, yeah, yeah. because Bobby was was the attack dog. So Lyndon has this problem now, and it's Bobby Kennedy, really, because he's leaking the stories. He's going after the mob. But if you kill Bobby Kennedy... Jack Kennedy goes after whoever did it with the full force of the United States government. Right. So you kill Jack Kennedy and it cuts Bobby off at his knees. He has no rabbi. He has no, he's done. Right. And so that is where I believe all this started taking place. And Lyndon Baines Johnson had heart disease in his family. People didn't live much longer than 58 years old. And he knew, and he was right. He only lived till 1973 that, with, you know, in his family, there's just not longevity. And he it was his goal to be president and he wanted to be president. And, you know, Jack is going to be the guy in the ticket in 64. So he'd have to wait till 68. So Lennon had to do something. Now, we've all heard the story about the night before where he comes out of that some party saying those Kennedy boys will never embarrass me again, those son of a bitches. And a lot of people were heard him saying that. And he's talking about the next day. Now. So I just want to say so much protocol was broken. And first of which, the parade route. Now, any Secret Service agent will tell you they go over the parade route. They look at all the buildings, make sure there's no open windows. And you can see by watching the Zapruder film, there's windows are open everywhere. There were there were like 20 things that weren't done. So let's 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 mention first that. Kennedy is now campaigning yes to for uh to run for president again right yeah you know as an incumbent but so he's now on the campaign trail so they know where he's going yeah you know you know where he's going it's not like he was driving home from wherever they didn't know they know the route they know what he's doing he's campaigning and he's in Texas yeah I'm sorry I didn't say that so and meanwhile this Bobby Baker story is being leaked or you know people are reading it. Now, it doesn't come out and say in the first, I think two of six come out, but it's going to basically name Lyndon Baines Johnson as the problem. And so he knows I've got to get rid of JFK. So they go to Dallas, then they go to San, I'm sorry, they go to Miami, then they go to Texas. I believe they went to San Antonio, then Houston, and they fly into Fort Worth. And the Secret Service agents went to a place called The Cellar, nine of them. They were drinking- The night before. The night before, which is not allowed. Right. They stayed up till five o'clock in the morning. Some of them showed up drunk and hung over, so bad that Earl Warren and the Warren Commission said they all should have been fired on the spot. Right. Now, think about that. A Secret Service agent there to protect the president. Right. Drinking. The night before. Shows up that drunk. Right. And they showed up at 5 a.m. And apparently some of them lost their badges and their guns that night. So the Warren 
The Warren Commission, by the way, is a commission that was put together by Congress to investigate yeah. after the assassination. Yeah, I was going to talk more about it. I'm right. getting a little ahead okay. of myself, but I just wanted you to know that it was so egregious that Earl Warren said they should have been fired on the spot. So you've got service agents showing up. Then we also had a last minute change of the parade route. Okay. Now, normally this stuff is taken so care of in advance so the Secret Service can go and say, hey, check out that window and I'll take this building here and we got to make sure all these windows are secure and put Secret Service tape on them saying you can't open them. Yeah, they pull up the sewer mains. They look at the they, sewer mains. Like everywhere. What if, they, what if they plant, you know, a, 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 a bomb, a bomb under the sewer main? Sure. They could be driving over, blow the whole – like they they not, they not cap them or they, they clear them and then they, they weld them shut. Like, I mean, they, they go to great length. They'll remove they'll remove U.S. Uh, or, or um, any type of obstacle or anything. You could put anything like um, U.S. mailboxes, sure. all kinds of shit. Sure. And, you know, th they have to do their vetting on the route. Well, they, the trade route gets changed. And it's egregious. And I hope we can pull up the Zapruder film at some point. But I want people to understand a presidential limousine should never slow down any slower than 20 miles an hour. And I forgot to mention, they're in an open air limousine. Right. Now, the only way the bubble, the bullet protective bubble was going to go over it is if it rains or Jackie's hair gets messed up. Okay. So they were driving slow enough or hair didn't get messed up. But you can't drive slow. Right. I mean, that's just insanity to me. So they go from Main Street. And turn on to Houston, and this is where the book depository is, and then turn down Elm. It's like a hairpin turn, and they're going like one or two miles an hour in that turn. It's so slow. Right. And it's so ridiculously slow that, that the Secret Service agents can basically run and keep up with the car if they want to. But the crazy thing is they're basically standing on the car behind the Kennedy and Connolly limousine, not riding on the sideboards. Now, Governor Connolly, John Connolly was the governor of Texas. He was in the car with the Kennedys. They were both in the jump seats. There was a lot of argument beforehand who would ride in what car. Now, I'm going to say that LBJ is a tech senator from the state of Texas. He knows all the players there. He controls all the strings. He's the one that wanted the parade route to be the way it was. And he wanted Connolly in the car with Kennedy. He's riding a couple cars back and he's fully he, flanked. He, he by didn't security. want to be sitting right next to Kennedy. He, no. And he was fully flanked by Secret Service agents. Now, how does that make sense? Right. So you got you just have to ask yourself. So they slow down to like. Two, three miles an hour, make that hairpin turn from Houston Street on to Elm Street. Now, Elm Street, it's going to take them to the trademark. That is where there's a, uh, a luncheon conference speaking engagement for President Kennedy at the trademark. And it's just down the street under the, you know, to the overpass. It's not far away. Right. But it's a real funny route how they went. This way, only to go back that way. Don't ask me why. And maybe there's a logical explanation. Maybe there wasn't an exit for it. But anyway, this is totally against Secret Service protocol. Even at the time. Even at the time. Okay. Totally against protocol not to have, I uh, heard Mark Gruber, another great guy, talks about Kennedy. He said they basically de-shielded the president. Right. He's supposed to have a human shield in front of him. If you remember when Ronald Reagan got shot, uh, Thomas Dolahanty a police officer and Timothy McCarthy, a secret service agent, they made right. themselves big. Right. So, and one took a shot right in the gut. The only reason Reagan got shot was when the secret service grabbed him and pushed him in. They think a shot ricocheted off the car. Yeah. It was, I was going to say, he didn't he even got, know he was shot right he got, away. He got, he got shot, but I remember it was ricocheted. Yeah. I remember mm -hmm. Reagan was, yep. when Reagan was, uh, they were prepping him for, uh, for surgery. Yeah. He, he stops just before they're, going to put like the mask on he stops and the doctor's standing around him and he looks stops and he goes 
I sure hope you guys are all Republicans <laughs> like that. And they said, we are today. Mr. We President. are today, Mr. President. Yeah. <laughs> they put the- and what's crazy is, is he walked in the hospital under his own power and he almost died. He didn't even realize he was shot. They took him there just out of safety precautions. And meanwhile, he's got a big blood stain under his arm. So, you know, the other funny thing is like, uh, what was it? A few months after that, mm-hmm. he's giving a, a speech. Reagan's giving a speech and a balloon pops in the distance. Wow. And he goes, miss me. <laughs> and then he keeps right on keeps going. And doesn't doesn't miss a beat. Hilarious, bro. Yeah, he, he was a gr- he was great. So. So I, I just hope that the, the viewer understands you got drunk service agents. We've got a, a top. A car without a top on it. There's really no protection for the the vehicle. Striving through a shooting range. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And the last thing that was said before the shooting starts is Governor Connolly's wife says, well, you can't say that Texas doesn't love you, Mr. President. And then we know from the microphones that are open on the the motorcycle cops, you can start hearing. Yeah. The popping noises. Some people thought it was cars backfiring. And as he goes in front of the sixth floor book depository and on down past the trees by the grassy knoll, their versions of events were one shot went through Kennedy's back, out his throat, changed in midair, hit Governor Connolly in the arm. And came out and landed in his leg. And this is the shot that's now called uh, Exhibit 399 with the Warren Commission, the magic bullet. Right. And the magic bullet is missing hardly any lead, I guess would be. Any lead from, you know, it's still a jacketed uh, bullet. It's missing. There's no lead. Yeah, it's almost it's in almost pristine. pristine it's been condition. fired. It's been fired. There's yeah. rifling. You yeah, can, yeah, you, you can, can see the striations it. on it. Yeah, but it's almost as if someone shot it into water. Into water. I was going to say water. Or sand, not mm-hmm. even sand. Yeah, it's, it's, it is exactly it like looks, it was fired. That's how they do it in the ballistics. Yeah, right? like they fired it because I mean, it's ballistics it's, jelly. Maybe. Yeah, it's yeah. perfect. It's, it's in pristine. perfect shape. It certainly doesn't look like a bullet that because we, we had pulled it up earlier to show Colby. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't look like a bullet that has gone through one person struck bone multiple times because listen at that rate that a bullet's traveling Mm -hmm. anything it hits it's going to dent the bullet it's going to change it it's going to alter it and it it certainly doesn't look like a bullet that's bounced off and even changed direction changed 180 degrees in midair in midair well even if it hit the hits his bone like i can see he hit the bone and it ricochets well then if it ricocheted and it hit that bone then it would have dramatically altered that bullet Absolutely. if it didn't blow it into pieces at the very least would have dented the living crap out of it and everybody's seen bullets that have gone through people Absolutely. You know, they're smushed. They look like mushrooms. Yeah, they're all tiny little up and flattened caps, basically what they look like. Yeah, this thing's perfect. It's in pristine condition. So that one, and you can go on the Zapruder film, and I, I encourage anybody to, to watch the Zapruder film when JFK is doing this. Connolly is still looking to the side. But then you'll later see Connolly, he'll flop over towards his wife because – I believe he got shot in the leg. He got right. shot in the arm. Uh, Secret Service agents and nurses that went out there said, it looked like there was a hail of gunfire. There was shrapnel all over that limousine. Right. Now, Colby also, I gave, showed him a picture of when the limousine was at Parkland Hospital, there was a, a bullet hole in the front windshield. Right. And guess what, folks? You can't put a bullet hole in the front windshield where it's at. From 64 feet in the air from the book deposit. But we'll get to that in a second here. So, after the throat shot, Jack is clutching his throat. And Jackie kind of leans over to see what, you know, to, to care for her husband. Right. And she almost becomes parallel with him. And she's certainly parallel from her face to his face to where the sixth floor would be. In the Texas Depository. In the Texas Depository building where Lee Harvey Oswald was supposedly shooting. Now, he's far enough down by that time. 
any sniper worth his salt is not going to hang out of a window. Right. He's going to set his platform up four or five feet, like the movie Sniper talks about that. Right. It's a yeah. perfect example. Yeah. You're going to set the platform up so nobody sees any uh, powder come, any fire off the muzzle flash, any of that. You're going to keep that hidden. But of course, they they want you to think that Oswald was hanging out using... Now, the cheapest rifle you can buy a back bolt, then. Bolt action. A bolt action Mannlichter Carcano. Now, the Mannlichter Carcano was called the humanitarian rifle. You know why? Because nobody got killed when people okay. used it. It was that bad. It was that unreliable of a weapon. And so, if you're going to commit the crime of the century, it's like, well, let's get a, a Red Rider Daisy... BB gun and shoot him. I mean, right. it, it's that stupid. Why would you use a man like your Carcano? Get a Mauser or a Winchester or something. Get something that looks like it, you could have pulled so, it off. So what right. what happened? We, we would we would find out is an American businessman bought a thousand man like their Carcano from Italy and thought that he could retrofit them, and he basically threw all his money away. And apparently Oswald had bought one of those rifles, and that's Life Magazine. You see him pictured with right. it, the famous Oswald picture. Yeah, he's got it. Yeah. And he's showing that rifle off. Now, it's also important to note, and I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, when they first went to the sniper's nest, they said the rifle was a Mauser, a German-made Mauser. But I, I digress. We're back in the, the shooting here. So, Jackie's almost parallel, and that's when the fatal headshot comes. And you can... Colby's going to pull it up. You can clearly see the explosion on his head. Yeah. His skull cap flies back and Jackie has to go back and get a she, piece of it. She's scoop. She's like scooping up her. Br I mean, you, you know, she's pan. I mean, she's in uh, what, what do you call it when you're um, I mean, she's panicked, but she's, she's in also, shock. You know? She's in shock. Thank you. She's not thinking clearly. She literally scoops up his brains and, and, the, and, and the, the back, back of the skull. Of skull. And thinking picks it up th like, like on a moving like you, limousine. Like we could put like, oh, he let's put this back together. Like, you know, it's horrible. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Oh, it's yeah. just like fucking what was she thinking? You know, what what's she going through? She well, just I think it's pretty amazing that she thought that. I mean, she was just trying to care for her husband. But again, this is according to I, Dave. I this, think most people would have just been like and I, I, I would have just been like, Well, whoa i don't think i would have even like so yeah you, i would have been like whoa you know i i i mean to me like this guy's head just blew apart in front she of didn't me. flinch she did Matt. she fucking whoo, grabs it starts grabbing him she's like yeah and i believe it was clint hill the secret service agent assigned to jackie wrapped his head in his jacket now kennedy was still breathing at the time and that's when they take off for dallas parkland hospital now i've got to jump forward just for a second here, because this is important. A young man, a black man, was eating his lunch that worked in the school book depository, and he's testifying before the Warren Commission. And we know the assassination took place at 1230. And we know there's a sniper's nest that was there on the sixth floor depository. But the man said, no, I didn't leave till 1225. I Finished my lunch, walked downstairs and saw the president go by. Now, this is important because that sniper's nest was set up. They had to move boxes around and, and right. put and they couldn't get the timeline right. And this and that man was a major monkey wrench in their timeline of the assassination. And I love it just because he knew what they were trying to do. And he was stuck to his guns and said, No, I stay there till I was 12, 12 25. So the president goes to the hospital and the limousine is parked outside right in where the emergency area is. Now, I believe you got a picture of that, Colby, and you can see the blood and brain matter in the back seat. It's 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 very sad uh, when you when you I showed my mom that picture last night and that's that's JFK's brain matter on the seat there mm -hmm. when you when you really think about it. And so the nurses had went out there and they, you know, and one was saying they looked at it and she was going to clean up. But it's basically, it's a murder scene. So you got to leave it alone. Mm -hmm. Nope. LBJ had that limo 
shipped off to Cincinnati right away to get cleaned up and refurbished. That's a murder scene. Right. And I could talk 10 minutes on the going on to the hospital, but I just want everybody to understand Texas law mandates when there's a murder, there has to be an autopsy. It's state law. Right. The body has to have go through an autopsy. So according to Dr. Charles Crenshaw, great book, he just recently passed away. He said the secrets are mainly the FBI came in and were pushing doctors and nurses away to, to get, get a hold body. of the body. To get the body. They ship it out immediately. Immediately. Because I, as we would see in the autopsy later, they had to do some things there. And anybody that's done it, you know, could look at the autopsy photos and know that it's, it's been doctored. They put putty and clay in certain places because they have to make it look like the entry wound came here. But we know that his back of his skull was blown off. So, and that that's crazy that you're pushing around doctors to get and breaking Texas law. So, it, what's what's interesting, uh, Colby, is that so if you look at his body, it's blown backward. You know what I'm saying? Like the, it blows out the back of his. Head. It's like it's so obvious the bullet had to have entered the front. Yeah, the front because Jackie comes here and he goes mm. right. But they're saying, no, it hit him from behind and he blew backwards like that. How is that even possible? And if you watch the movie That's JFK an, an by Albert Stone, Oliver uh, Stone. Kevin Oliver Stone Oliver. movie, Kevin Costner keeps saying back and to the right, back and to the right. Yeah. That's kind of the theme of the movie because they get, a you know, they're showing the Zapruder film. It's a great movie. Great. It's a really good movie. And, you know, it's funny. I was listening to Mark Grobear. who got a, he's a great podcast himself he knows oliver stone and he's you know diehard liberal yeah and it's been hard for him to stomach that he's now realized that lbj was behind the assassination right because he wanted to blame the cubans or the russians or the mob or what at cia yeah. well it was who who could make all this happen who could get a body out yeah, of who texas could pull, pull all the strings because the cover-ups even more important than the assassination itself. So, right after the assassination, people are running to the grassy knoll area because they see smoke. They smell cordite, the, the smell of gunpowder. Yeah. And they're running up there. Well, there's people that say they saw. Aren't there people they that say saw, oh, they saw sure. gunfire? There they saw people, people up there. There are people that took pictures only to have their film confiscated and they never got it back again. Okay. And, and I mean, think about right. that. This would come up later in Bobby's assassination. So and the guy would actually win a lawsuit against the FBI over that. So you've got, Colby, you've got the Texas depository here. You got the car here. And you've got like the, the grassy knoll here. Like all, if you know where they with all the little, are. With the little natural fence and shrubbery. That you can, yeah, it's it's like like this is this is where everything came from. Like everybody is in the the, this is the version that makes sense for the trajectory of every single bullet. Not here. So so people have to understand if you're shooting from up there, and this is the the main crux of what I want to say. If you're shooting from up there, why wouldn't you take a shot on Houston Street? When you've got a per, you've got a target coming into focus, right? And you've got a clean shot. Yeah, yeah. So it's coming. So initially, it, it, that bend. Remember how you talked about that 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 um, what you say hair hairpin, hairpin turn? turns that hairpin turn is home. right here. So you're here. You could fire any time, the whole time, and the target's they only getting bigger. They wait till it. Till he makes it slows down, makes a hairpin turn, and now he's still slow. It's perfect. Now, the same position this guy that Oswald would have been in, now he's in. He takes the shot, though. Oswald doesn't. Yeah. And you got to understand, it's a seven-degree grade. It's a right, the left, back, right turn. And you're shooting through trees using a bolt-action rifle. Right. But, well, so, I, I but saw, if it was Oswald, just shoot him on Houston Street when the when the target's getting closer and bigger. Right. It just well, doesn't I, make sense. I saw a, a 
documentary where they show they try and reenact the oh, whole thing sure. they, they they just can't like well actually i think they do hit oh they do they hit a watermelon but you know you get a good guy that can work a bolt but, action but they also that. it took it took like three or four different snipers and eventually they, they end up sure. it's like okay great so so two out of ten shots you right. could you know or 20 shots where you could make with a with an oswald wasn't even a good shot no and the the actual weapon he used the scope Although the scope could have been altered later or broken mm-hmm. during move or being moved during the movement of the weapon, it, it actually didn't work. Like right. it, it was off. It was misaligned. It was, yeah, misaligned. Thank you. And and that's another thing. It just doesn't make yeah. sense when you really start looking at the facts of it. Shoot them on Houston Street. You've got a perfect shot. Why wait till you're in a seven degree grade for left to right, back to left again from a target moving away from you? Not only that. You've got his wife now st- almost straddling him. So when you look at the actual the, the death shot, Jackie will almost be straddling him. So where her head would line up perfectly with the sixth floor deposit with Jack's head right in the middle. You can't shoot Jackie. Right. There would have been such an outcry because half the country doesn't like Jack, which just face it. But everybody loved Jackie. Right. But the guys over here, they had a perfectly perfect clean shot. shot. And these are professional assassins. So, so no, get back to Oswald. And I just want to touch on him for a second. He went, was in the Marines and he defected to the Soviet Union. Right. This is important to remember. He defects to the Soviet Union. So this is like the height of, this is the height of the Cold War, Cold War, which is probably the height of the Cold War. 10 year span, 10 to 15 years. And we're kids of the Cold War. We grew up and we were told the Russians can blow up the world 10 times over and, and, it was very scary. Anybody in the CIA operated on Moscow rules, like trust nobody if you're out on the street. You know, very scary time to be living in. So, but uh, there, there, so there's a, a huge, you know, the obviously the ideologies are different, but it, there's a, a huge push um, for you know, um, you know, capitalism and democracy and everything, and and obviously you know, uh, communism and. Uh, Oswald becomes disenfranchised with the United States. Supposedly. Supposedly. And well, he defects to the Soviet Union. He defects to the Soviet which is Union. pretty odd. Yeah. That's just crazy. Odd. Right. That's pretty he odd. He marries a Russian woman, but is allowed right. to leave. Right. Well, and, but here's the thing, too. When he gets there, the so- communism isn't what he thinks it is. No. You see what I'm saying? He gets Jim there. Jim Philby had the same issue. Right. He gets there and he's like, Guess what? There's a hierarchy here. There's not supposed to be a hierarchy in communism. There's a hierarchy. There's the party. Uh, they're they're not. You know, there's there's it's is massively corrupt, more corrupt than the United States. I'm not getting anywhere here. And he becomes disenfranchised, and he leaves. He but leaves. he's still a communist. He still believes in communism. Supposedly, yeah. But if you renounce your U.S. citizenship and you go to Soviet Russia, you marry a a Russian women, it just wasn't in those days you could leave the Soviet Union. You had to get smuggled out. But somehow he was able to leave. With the wife. With the wife. And they settle in Texas. And, and he starts, pa- he's passing out flyers. Passing out flyers. Hands off Cuba. Yeah. And his wife and he are having, going through a rough time. So she's living with uh, a Mrs. Payne. Who would be a CIA agent? She was an agent. And we know this now, but at the time, they didn't know. And those two were having a love affair. So Oswald will be going to Mrs. Payne's house to check on his wife. And they're keeping tabs. And so after the assassination, they would go to Mrs. Payne's house. And she tells the police, we were expecting you. What does that mean? So, anyway, so we've talked about the hospital. They they, they, they grab the body, they grab the body out there, bring it straight to Air Force One. Air Force One. They fly back. Everybody's seen pictures of a very somber Jackie standing next to LBJ, getting sworn in. But what what right. we don't hear okay. is when she went back to her quarters. He's laying on her bed. Oh, I didn't know. I'm, I, I mean, so disrespectful. Right. Well, here's the other, the other thing is uh, 
LBJ or, you know, Johnson insists that he be sworn in immediately before the plane even takes off. Like he's like, I'm the I'm now the president. It's like, bro, this dude's body's not cold. And the Kennedy, his his staff, they're pissed. They're so angry. Their guys are down in the cargo hold and Johnson's calling the shots and they're not happy. And you have a very frosty relationship on that airplane between the two. It was bad before. Imagine how it is now, because I'm sure a lot of them are putting two and two together. Right. Well, we're in Texas, his home state. He changed the parade route on us. That's the worst dis- display of of secret service agents i've ever seen in my life nine of them showed up drunk and hung over this morning there weren't there was no protective shield around the president on the street when the car was going three miles an hour so they had to be wondering matt right this is a sublimely ridiculous and now he's he, so she, jackie goes back into her quarters air force one's beautiful it's like an apartment building and lbj is sprawled out on the bed and like, oh, I'm sorry, Jackie. Didn't even give her the courtesy to either get her things out of that room. I don't I don't know what protocol right. would be. I don't want to even pretend to, but it created a big problem. Now, just to skip ahead, I want everybody to understand. Jackie wore that pink dress for 48 hours. And she was quoted saying, I want them to see what they did. Right. Who's them? Well, I think it, she only was in the White House. Right. So she wanted them to see what they did. Well, she wore, now on her dress, there's brain matter and blood splatter and because she cradled his head after the fatal shot came. So, and she kept that dress on for a full another day after that. I want now, them to see what they did. Now, immediately, Oswald puts together Oswald's version is that he puts together that he's been set up. Yes. He, well, he, what he does is he, and I, I honestly believe in my heart of hearts, I think he might've known what was going down. He might've, because. And you think he well, might've had a plan yeah, to assassinate? Because, well, it's come out in the last year, a woman has, she's kept the slip. She worked at the police station and Oswald got his one phone call. And there were men that came down with the lady and men said, whoever he's going to call, let us know. And so he asked to talk to a number in South Carolina. And they said, okay, I'm connecting you. And the men basically. Right. I'm sorry. There was nobody answered and they had the phone number. She kept the slip, but the, CIA, whoever it was. Immediately go there, right? You know, well, they basically said, we weren't here, but you, he can't talk to anybody. Right. So they kept him from talking to anybody. And we now know it was naval intelligence, someone in naval intelligence that Oswald was calling. So that makes you, he was pretty, he got in and out of Russia. You know, right, right, right. He, 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 thumbs up. Oswald knew what was, I, I can't say that definitively, Matt. Right. But and he definitely was a patsy, but I think he might have known more what was going on than your average Joe. Right. And that's the big thing, Colby, is that he I mean says, they had him take the job at the six in the book depository. He's gonna since he's working with books and ink has lead in it, he's gonna fail a paraffin test, which is what they test people's hands for if you fired a gun. So he he, you know, Oswald is basically placed in the in this building and after the whole thing goes down he he immediately takes off like he knows something's wrong now whether or not he actually what uh fire uh, was planning on you know actually fired the gun um you know was in on the assassination or it was just a complete setup and he's sitting there eating his eating his lunch and realizes and hears the president's been killed and real puts it together at that moment like Oh, shit. Yeah. Like, because an, a, an officer came in 90 seconds after the or 60 seconds after the assassination, and he's drinking a Coke on the bottom floor. Now, it's important to remember that day the elevators were not working in the school book depository. And there were the way it was set up with the stairs, you could see when people were going down the stairs. 
And there were two secretaries that gave sworn statements. They said they never saw Oswald go down the stairs. So he's not there when the shots are even fired. So, but he's in the book depository. So, so he takes off immediately. As soon as he realizes that, as soon as he realizes that, um, that the president's been shot, either he was a part of it, knew it, or he, at the very least, he knows something's wrong. So he immediately bolts. He leaves the Texas depository and immediately hauls ass and walks. How many blocks to like, he goes to a, um, yeah, supposedly that he, he went, if, if the, the theater's here, J.D. Tip at the police officer shot here. It's like almost a mile one way. And he would have had to jog at a really fast speed, almost a full broke out run. But people, you so can a, do it. A police officer stops around him. around and go the other way. So you're saying the police officer stops him. So the, uh, uh, Supposedly. Suppose, okay. Now, supposedly a police officer stops him. He kills him. Right? He shoots him. Yeah. Shoots him and kills him. Oswald now, every him. eyewitness that Not a nice there, guy. Nobody said he's saying he's a nice guy. Yeah. <laughs> Now, yeah, every, but everybody that lives, there's people that still live in those houses to that day. Right. And the description they gave, none of it fit Oswald. It was two men. There was a confrontation. Right. Okay. So, so the, the, then the official, you know, uh, narrative, narrative is, is that he takes off down. Then goes back the other way and goes to a theater. Right. Where he doesn't pay for a ticket and he's going to meet somebody. And 14 police cars show up to arrest a guy that doesn't, that didn't pay for a movie ticket. I mean, because he's, how, how could he be a suspect in the Kennedy assassination? He's already been cleared because when they were going around after, right after the assassination, they went, who's this guy? That's Lee Oswald. He works here. Right. Cleared. Okay. Because they weren't letting people out. They wanted they were systematically looking around. There were people doing the right thing, right. trying to figure out what was going on there. I'm going to posit you had the Dal Tex building, you had the Grassy Knoll, you had shots coming from all, and some people were wearing badges and having, you know, credentials. Right. So, but Oswald was cleared of any wrongdoing. So he's not thinking at the time, you know, I, I don't believe, but then there's an APB out under his name for the shooting of J.D. Tippett. He goes to the 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 uh, How movie do they know theater, his name? or is it just a description? Or they have his name? I, I believe they I, could. They show up to Mrs. Payne's house, and she says, "Oh, we've been expecting you." Well, why would she say that? And they're looking for Oswald. Okay, and supposedly now this there's so much conjecture with this that he bought this big tube to the book depository with them that day, and that's where they they you know he could could transport the weapon, weapon back and forth. But the problem is, like I was saying earlier, with the gentleman that said I stayed in the in that that far left window in the school book depository is there wasn't enough time to set up a sniper's nest. I believe Matt that. Right after that, they started setting the sniper's nest. They they cleared everything off there. And they, Oswald never fired anything. Uh, Oswald, He's just having lunch. He, he might have known what was going on. Okay. Because I think he was connected. But so you're not going to use a bolt action rifle, shoot somebody that's going away from you. I mean, like we talked about earlier. But I could be wrong. I, we'll never know these right. answers unless we get the definitive answer. So but they, they grab him. They bring him to the police station. And right. he's got two different IDs on him. That's another thing that has come out. Oswald had two different IDs on him. They they question him for how long? Oh, they you know it's one of those things. They they kept him in there for seven or eight hours. Right. So then when he's leaving, they video him. They're, 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 the camera comes there, and he's got a black eye. And now, have you been way aware that you're you you know you're the suspect? For shooting the president of the United States of America, and he tells the whole world, "I'm a patsy," right. meaning I'm the fall guy. Yeah. I didn't shoot anybody, right. but they're making now. I think is when he really realizes, right. "Oh my gosh, I'm taking the blame for all this." Yeah, the fact that I, I think he probably did take off. I, I mean, so here's a theory: is that he's in the building. Maybe he doesn't know or he knows that there is a plot. He doesn't know when it's going to happen. He's being told he's going to take part in the plot. He's willing to maybe take part in the plot. Sure. Finds out that that 
you know, finds out that um, Kennedy's been shot. He then immediately re- puts it together in his mind. Oh, shit. I'm going to be a suspect. They're going to be coming here. I don't need to be here. Maybe he even already has an escape route. Sure. Like, who knows? You're going to do this, but it happens earlier than expected. Or he starts to realize something's wrong, but he still feels like maybe I'm just left out of the loop. Maybe some there was some of the plan changes. I just they need couldn't. to talk to my guy. He'll exactly. know what to do. Right. So I'm going to go ahead with the escape route. I'm going to try and I'm going to go ahead and try and make my escape route. And he's been told that, listen, if if you get pulled over, you cannot be caught. So he kills the police officer. He mm-hmm. then goes, maybe he's supposed to meet somebody wherever. So you got a couple different places you can meet them. Maybe one is the uh, is the movie theater. He goes there. He right. gets captured. Like, wh- who knows? Because it, it is the the area, the, the, the way he takes his route is counterintuitive from, you know, his where he's initially headed, right? Mm-hmm. So he heads one way, that doesn't work out, heads to the second place where he's going to be picked up. Then he gets grabbed. He tries to make the phone call to make contact. He's not allowed to make contact. And at this point, he's 100% sure, okay, I was never going to be able to be able to right. escape this. Right. I was always going to be a patsy and they're probably going to kill me. Right. And I, and I encourage anybody, there's a lot of YouTube videos on the murder of J.D. Tippett, the police officer, and they go back to the scene, that intersection where he was killed. And some of the same people live in the houses there and they'd be like, yep, I was standing right over there when Officer Tippett was shot. Oh, it wasn't Lee Oswald. It was two men and I saw him run around the car, you know, right. They, 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 it's pretty amazing. So Oswald gets caught. And here's where the conspiracy really starts taking hold, if it hasn't yet, is, as we all know, Jack Ruby, who is a nightclub owner in Dallas, is going to be giving where they're going to be moving him. Now, they told the press they were going to move Oswald here, but they secretly moved him down to the basement to avoid the press. Right. And Ruby was given that information. So Ruby, see, Colby knows none of this. I love that Colby doesn't know this because Colby, in a sense, is the audience. Okay, perfect. So so Jack Ruby owned several, are they strip clubs? Yeah, nightclubs in the Dallas area. Okay. And he's also connected to the mob. So... He's told, hey, and, and he kind of used to hang out at the police station too, right? Didn't he kind of, he was kind of had friends. He was that a were, hanger out of, there's people that, that, that they thought that when the, uh, Oswald was arrested, they can see Ruby in the background, kind of a hanger on. Right. So he liked that and, whole and, thing, law enforcement. So and, he, let's go ahead. And if I'm sorry, if he's got unscrupulous things going on at his joints, but it's got cops in there because he's paid them off. Then he doesn't have to worry about losing his liquor license or things like that. Right. Because so, he, they're all been paid off. So he, he has, his, he has his, his, his finger on the pulse of law enforcement in the area. And he gets word that they're moving Oswald, which in, an, is in, in and of itself isn't, isn't weird. But what's weird is what happens. Is what they told the press and everybody else. Yeah, he'll be here, but the secret movement was they were going to move him down in the garage, and Jack Ruby A knows where to go, and has, B has access. And you you can see this Colby right on the internet. He walks right up to Oswald, and you can there's a great oh. still of Life Magazine Oswald going like that, and he's get shot right in the gut. And keep in mind that he's where, Oswald, where are they moving him from? Are they moving him out of the police station to the, yeah, police station jail to the jail, I believe the jail. Right. So keep keep in mind too, the first chance Oswald has of being in front of the press, he says, I'm a patsy. So you can't let Oswald get tried. You no, can't let Oswald can't, talk to the press. They can't allow him to speak. The first chance he had, he said, I'm a patsy. He's put it together. He may be he knows credible. Now. He has to go. And I, I, and I, that phone call I was talking about earlier when he's talking, calling Naval Intelligence, you know, you can hear on the other line, the phone ringing and all that. Uh, Cause if someone were to answer, I have a Lee Oswald for a Matthew Cox, right. we accept the charges. I'm calling from the Dallas jail. And, you know, maybe he thought they'd be listening in, but 
when they said, yeah, nobody, he has to know they're not even going to let me talk to anybody. Right, right. I'm, I'm trapped. I'm trapped here. And he's come out and says, I'm a patsy. Now, whether he had any idea about the assassination and any inner working, who the players were, we'll never know that answer. But he knows that he's going to take the fall for it. Now, Walter Cronkite has come out and said, a Lee Harvey. And by the way, nobody used Harvey. He was Lee Oswald. But in America now, if someone gets in trouble, it's they have three names. It's David Scott Wilhauer was arrested this afternoon. You know, so and they, you got three names. So he knows he's in trouble. And now Cronkite has told the whole world his name. He's figured it out. Can't get a phone call. No lawyer was ever brought to him. And remember, they've interrogated him for hours and hours and hours. Right. No lawyer. Nobody came. And, and people like F. Lee Baylor were saying, I'll represent him. Some big he heavyweights because they'll do it for free because the notoriety they'll get. Right, right. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. But, but they, you don't want that. They didn't. They didn't. don't want a competent lawyer no. uh, representing him. No. That's a mistake. They need to remove him. So, Jack Ruby is a famous underworld guy of Dallas. Now, remember what I was saying before, the mob had connections to Joe Kennedy and th with the elections and whatnot. And the head of the FBI was J. Edgar Hoover. And J. Edgar Hoover had a boyfriend. Right. And he would drink in the speakeasies he's owned by the mob. And Hoover's main move was, let's say you're a freshman, a new uh, senator from Florida, and you go out one night and I show you pictures. Hey, Matt, this is you with that young girl. I'm sure your wife doesn't want to know about her. And, and this young lady, yeah, I'm sure your wife's not going to want to know. And that's how they blackmail you. And that's how Washington worked. And well, J. Edgar Hoover was famous for that, yeah, getting blackmail. I was going to say also the thing is like president after president after president, all of them said, when I'm elected, I'm going to get rid of J. Edgar Hoover, like everyone that yes. comes along the pike. And then, of course, they call him into his office and well, I'm going to fire him today. He comes in, he puts down a, a file and yeah. says, and they say, look, J. Edgar, you've done a great job, but it's time to step down. He says, yeah, OK, so uh, here's here's a, when you're a senator in 64, yeah, here's take like, a look at that. I got yeah. this. I got this. I got this. And I got some recordings we can play on the uh Real here, if you want, of phone calls between you and this. Here's some you taking bribes. Here's this. Yeah. Here's your uncle. Here's your, you know, like, what are you going to do? Am I still, are yeah. you still going to ask me to resign? And uh, think about no, it. no, of course not. And think about it. And it's no different than our uh, Palm Beach boy that uh, somehow hung himself in a New York jail. Oh, you mean, uh, um, I can't on, think of his name uh, either. Uh, Epstein. Epstein. Lo no different than Epstein. I truly believe now, Matt, that Epstein's job was to compromise all those heavyweights that to invite them yeah, to the invite them sure. to the island, yeah. get them compromised, yeah. get some stuff on them, send them mm -hmm. back into the wild sure. <laughs> wilderness. So now so they're needed. Absolutely. So, but the thing with J. Edgar is the mob had him. Remember, I said earlier, right. he never even said the word mafia. And these are you know you have New Yorkers that are paying protection rackets every month. And our own FBI won't even say the word mafia because they probably told J. Edgar, don't say it. Or the picture of you kissing your boyfriend. Right. It's going to be on the New York Times tomorrow. Right. So they had him under their thumb. So it, I, I mean, on top of that, he was just in general, J. Edgar Hoover was a complete scumbag. Yeah. I, I mean, we're talking about there are so many people that he just set up, mm -hmm. lied about places where he would place himself in the middle of an investigation. He had nothing about, mm -hmm. you know, he was famous for at the last minute having the FBI come in and take credit for investigations. They had nothing to do. That's why the CIA and the FBI have never gotten, gotten along for the longest time, because one would come and steal the other's thunder. I mean, but just yeah. crazy enough. LBJ and J. Edgar Hoover, even though they're far different, one was a womanizer, one obviously wasn't, they were very tight. Right. And I'm sure LBJ got his dirt on people from right. J. Edgar and quid pro quo. So it's no surprise that now we've got 
a nightclub owner, Jack Ruby, somehow goes and shoots Oswald. And Dr. Charles Crenshaw and other, some of the nurses that worked at Parkland Hospital said that LBJ would call right. and say, I, I want a deathbed confession from Oswald. Get, get one out of him. And they're like, well, he's not talking, sir. We'll get one out of him anyway. Right. Because he wanted Oswald to admit to shooting the president. And, and obviously, and after even interrogating in, him for six, seven, eight hours, not gonna he's, give it, he's certainly not going to give it while his, his belly's in shreds. Because right. apparently that bullet bounced around. And when, uh, when they pull it out, was it in pristine condition? Yeah, it, uh, <laughs> no, I think it was a smaller round that would bounce around there. Sometimes that's more effective than a, a higher caliber that's just going to go in and out. Yeah. So. So Oswald dies in the hospital, like in the, the hospital. Day. Yes. Yeah. And now the first order of business that LBJ does as president is get his buddies at McDonnell Douglas and Boeing and Texas Instruments to ramp up the war machine. Right. So in South Vietnam. Right. So Vietnam was going on. Kennedy doesn't really want anything to he, do with Vietnam. He, was, he doesn't he want wanted, to get involved in a He war. wanted to bring guys back. Right. He doesn't really want a war in Vietnam. Right. So. But LBJ does. Does. Because money. Always. There's yeah. a lot of money. And, 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 you know, to be fair, like, you know, communist communism is was spreading. growing. Yes. It's spreading in, very quickly. And in, in the 50s. You know, the viewers, so you understand, we had what was called McCarthyism. There was a communist scare in the United States. A lot of actors, uh, social, high social ranking people, and some of the people in Congress were members of the Communist Party or they had flirtations. And so Senator Joe McCarthy, he was outing anybody who had communist ties. And if you were an actor in Hollywood and you were found out to be a communist, your career was done. Right. Have you seen um have you seen uh Oppenheimer? No, I haven't. Oh. Was it good? Yeah. Did you see it? Yeah. Yeah. Like he he went to a couple meetings. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? He went to a couple meetings. Like that's it. it ruined him. Yeah. Ruined him. Took yeah. away his security clearance. Yeah. And you know, and just as a sidebar, people think socialism's great. Well, Karl Marx says the goal of socialism is communism. Right. So don't ever think socialism's a good idea because the goal of socialism is communism. So we had, you know, the scare back then. And so when China and North Korea and North Vietnam get this communist ideas and they start spreading, well, they were worried about the spread of communism in the Far East. Uh, we, and then we had communist Cuba. We backed the uh, one time we did back Fidel Castro. And then unfortunately, I can't remember the guy's name. Batista. Batista yeah, yeah. was the former president. Yeah, we were all behind Cuba. Batista. Yeah. Then we realized what Fidel was all about and look what's happened there. And, you know, listen, Fidel Castro took over all of Cuba with like three or 400 men. Yeah. Because the New York Times went in and he convinced the New York Times that he had thousands and thousands of rebels ready to go into the Capitol and seize control. And so the New York Times starts putting out these articles. But really what he did was he they led the reporter through the mountains just to the same camps yep. over and, and over, over and yep. the same guys you're seeing and real quickly leads them out. And there's like, how many do you have? Think, oh, my gosh, there's a bunch of them. Thousands, it just goes to show thousands. the pen is mightier than the sword. Right. Yeah. And, and that's so true. When Castro goes in, Batista takes off. He's got like 45,000 men. And Castro's got like. You know, whatever. 3,000, 4,000. Yeah, a few thousand at that point. Because he's gathering troops. As they're going, people are joining. They think he can. They think he's got all these troops. No, he doesn't. No, I've got about three or 400. And people start joining. By the time he gets there, he's still only got. And these are military guys. And still, they, they flee. They flee. One, one of my best friends, Rolando Hernandez, he truly believes that if we would go and invade Cuba, they would throw down their guns get on the planes and go to Mexico. So there, nobody would fight us. No, I think a small private security force could take I, I it agree. over. I agree. 
I think and, Frank Amadeo, if we gave him six months, could fo- probably take the place over. Get, get Frank involved. So, <laughs> <laughs> like anybody who watches my stuff will be yeah, like, wow, "Yeah, that's right." So, communism was real. I mean, it, it, it was definitely growing, and you have to understand all the Soviet states that are that are now free countries, like Georgia and Uzbekistan. Those were all that was all the Soviet Iron Curtain back then, and. It was just a very scary, scary time in America. And so you didn't want to be associated with communism. And we were really worried about the expanse of communism. But Kennedy didn't want Kennedy had seen war. Like like Matt said, he got hurt in World War Two. And he didn't want to send more advisors there. He wanted to pull them back. But LBJ thought, nope, all his buddies that are these big CEOs, these big corporations, we're going to get the war machine going and they'd make millions off of that. Like I said, you know, where else can you, and you get you this- campaign for three, you know, spend $3 million for a job that pays 140,000. Oh, the United States Congress, because you can sell your influence. And that's what, and when you have a war involved, all that influence goes so much farther. That's why you see a lot of guys leave Congress and they go become a lobbyist. Mm-hmm. And that's what's really wrong. That's what the initial warning from Eisenhower was. The military industrial complex. Watch out for it. Right. And we're, we're swimming in it now. And that same, you know, Pelosi's husband's the greatest stock picker in the world. I mean, you've got these people. And B- Bobby Baker, Lyndon's boy, his salary was $11,000 a year. Right. Who would work? He for was that. worth two and a half million dollars. Well, you know, he's good. He's a good. He's, <laughs> he did a good job he, he for knows, Lyndon. He knows when to invest. Said, boy, go get this done. I'll give you a bonus. <laughs> so. So anyway, that's that's the problem. Obviously, it's not it's gotten only worse, not better. So Johnson is president knows there's enough people that have complained about it. We've had witnesses that saw the assassination. 48 hours later, they're dead. And word has trickled out that this assassination, Lee Harvey Oswald, may not have been the shooter. So he's got to put that to bed. So he starts, he gets former Chief Justice Earl Warren and creates what's called the Warren Commission. And members, on the Warren Commission are ex people in government, uh, Gerald Ford, uh, young uh, House representative guy from Michigan, my home state. My dad played uh, ping pong against President Ford because my dad was the reigning champion at his college. Okay. He played Ford in ping pong. So, and he's a University of Michigan guy. Um, so he was on the Warren Commission. Uh, you had Alan Dulles, who I mentioned earlier, who right. John F. Kennedy fired. And they hated each other. He was on the Warren Commission. Arlen Specter was on the Warren Commission. So you had these different people in government. I have a question. Did the Warren Commission have the Zapruder film? No. Have access to the Zapruder? I, I don't believe so. Okay. Because the Zapruder film wouldn't surface until the 70s. All right. But so they're getting all the evidence, uh, the statements from – Anybody who was there, Secret Service, all the witnesses, any. Now, remember, though, they have to shape this that Oswald acted alone. That's the only outcome. And that's what it's going to say, that Oswald acted alone. So they have to shape everything to fit that narrative. There were people that were eyewitnesses that said, yeah, I was standing in the grassy knoll and I heard a bullet whiz by my head. Right. Those people were never called. Right. Go figure. And so I, I mentioned to you that the gentleman that was sitting in the sixth floor, in the far left window of the book depository, that right. fought back and forth with the Warren Commission because they kept telling him, no, you left here. No, no, no. I didn't leave till... 1225. Well, that doesn't give a sniper time to get room and set up everything right. and put a shot. So I just thought that was kind of funny. But anybody that fit the narrative gets called of the Warren Commission gets called. And so they concoct 
the magic bullet theory. That's where that whole thing came up because when they found the sniper's perch, there were three spent shells. And one of the problems is a young gentleman standing farther down Elm Street got hit in the face by a ricochet. Right. And so they, they had to account for that bullet. So one bullet has to have missed missed completely. Missed completely. Now, just knowing what we know now, we know that one hit one of the motorcycle bikes. We know that one, as Kobe has a picture, went through the front dashboard. Mm-hmm. We won that, you know, a couple landed in Connolly. One went through JFK's back and one hit him. And so there's six or seven or eight shots right. at least. But another problem with Dealey Plaza there is shots create echoes and it confuses people. How many times did you hear something? Right. And plus people that have come out now. Now, I don't know if it's true or not, have said, yeah, I was there and I was using a suppressor. So a suppressed fire sounds completely different. Right. Like you and I watch TV shows and, you know, bang, bang, shoot them up. And they're like, hey, Matt, should we go around the corner? Right. Dude, if you were just shooting guns, you'd be like, yeah, give me five minutes so I can hear again. Right. And if you're shooting your gut, you know, yeah. any pistol or revolver without ear protection, you can't hear for five minutes. Right. But anyway, the, the movies make it sound. They exaggerate that terrible so people were in the motorcade it's like i said they could smell the cordite which you can't smell the cordite if it's if, six if you're six going forward from up. behind right you're not going to smell that right some people have even thought that down at the end of elm street there's a drain now i, I heard the drain now in a storm drain the water flows down here but there's a manhole cover and you can open the manhole and climb down but people thought that they, they thought maybe there was guns pointing. Now, some people that I trust their knowledge on this said they don't believe that happened. Some people say, absolutely. That's a perfect angle of the shot. Once the car kind of veered left, perfect shot to Jack. Right. So I don't know. But we know about the grassy knoll. Who knows where the other pe- shooters are? Some people believe if Elm Street goes this way, they cut what's called the Dow Tex building. Which was with the you know the book depositories here, the Dow Tech buildings here. They had a straight shot going that way to his back. Right. So there might have been people shooting all different places. Now I also there's books that people believe someone was on top of the school book depository, okay. taking shots. He went downstairs and then put the the rifle and the the spent shell casings where Oswald supposedly right. was. But okay, the whole thing is to set up Oswald, yeah. as we know now. And set so, up Oswald and get rid of him. And yeah, get rid of him. They've taken care of that. Now Ruby is obviously arrested, and he wants to talk, right? And they can't let Ruby talk. I mean, he tells the powers to be talk to certain lawyers, talk to Dorothy Kilgallen. I mentioned her earlier because Ted Kennedy mentioned her, believed that she was murder. A guy named Mark Stone wrote a book. He's wrote and written a couple books about Dorothy Kilgallen and her search for the truth in the Kennedy assassination. And she had a great affection for Kennedy because he was very sweet to her little boy. She brought him to the White House, blah, blah, blah. And she was an investigative reporter, a very good one. She was on the TV show, What's My Line? But she was like the number one investigative reporter, certainly female investigative reporter in the nation. And she told those around her, I know who murdered the president. And I'm going to get going to New Orleans to get that information. She didn't last two nights. She was found dead in her apartment. And without going into details, there was a lot of irregularities. You know, her glasses were on. She was sleeping. She didn't have her wig. You know, people that know her well, like, why was she here? Why was she wearing that? That just doesn't make sense. She might have had drank, but she didn't take pills. And she was found with. Right. There was too much to live for, for her to OD. So, but she told people and she even told her, I think her cameraman, you can't come with me. It's too dangerous. I got to be able to move in and out of new orleans and we know new orleans being a place 
because that's where Lee Harvey Oswald and certain people were before the murders, you know, hands off Cuba. Right. Now, what's funny, Matt, is where their headquarters were, the hands off Cuba, that Oswald ha- would be handing out pamphlets. And I believe this was just to set up the narrative. This whole assassination was planned months in advance because right next door was the CIA secret building. All right. Go figure. So right in New Orleans there, right next door. Okay. And if you watch the movie JFK, David Ferry and all those people, they're all eliminated. All right. So, you know, three people can tell keep a secret if two of them are dead, right? right. So that that's kind of the issue we have here. So Jack Ruby now, he's sitting in jail. He tells the United States of American people, I did it because I love this country. Nah. And, and he it, didn't want to drag uh he didn't want to drag uh Jackie Kennedy through, through a, trial. a trial. And you know, the, the sad image of JFK Jr. and a and a little jacket saluting his father's casket right is a lasting memory in a lot of uh, baby boomers minds and uh so you know understandable but it's not his motives jack ruby was was paid to do a job and he did it right but then he realizes he's getting left out in the cold right and he tells people i want to talk but i'm not safe here and for whatever reason, he wanted to get to Washington in front of the Justice Department. It's the only way he'd be safe. Jack Ruby was dead within months of a fast-acting cancer. Like they gave him a hot shot of cancer. That's the best way I can explain it. Right. He, was, it very, he went from perfect health to just disintegrating, declining health. Okay. And he didn't live. Because there's another person eliminated. So the Warren Commission comes out with its findings. They pick and choose who they want to testify. People that were there that saw it happen, that had their cameras confiscated, said they saw multiple gunmen. If they were lucky enough to survive, they weren't called before the Warren Commission. And there's... So many different people that could have testified that like people that said they saw people carrying rifles right to the assassination to to going back to the security guards or uh, the the secret service agent, just a whole plethora thing that that all add up to november twenty second nineteen sixty three Dallas, Texas. They, they could have just kept those hearings going on forever, but they picked and choose what they wanted. They came out with this volume that basically said Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone right. in shooting John F. Kennedy because of Kennedy's uh, stance on Cuba. Okay. It was, uh, you know, I guess that to be the best way, uh, you know, he was upset about that. And that's what the world believed. Now, I, I mentioned you guys earlier when the birds, David Crosby, the late David Crosby, stopped the concert and started telling people, I believe in San Francisco, that our president was murdered. Right. And so there, the national conscience kind of thought there was something hinky about the whole Kennedy assassination, but we didn't have this Zapruder film yet. Right. But- well, and you also the 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 Warren report, like all the reports and everything, all the all the documentation that they had to come up with this conclusion mm-hmm. was sealed. It was sealed. It was sealed. A great point, Matt. And they sealed it for sixty years, right? And so basically, anybody alive wouldn't be able to read it. And they right. pushed well, back the ceiling even after that. They say, well, anybody that would be anybody that would have been possibly implicated. By review, by an, an impartial review of those documents, 
if it did lead to this person, well, that person 60 years later is dead because he's probably 40 or 50 sure. at the time. And in 60 years, he's, he's going to be 110 and we'd be prosecuted. Like, that's not going to happen. And, and some of the people, some of the documents they've let out are completely redacted. So what redacted mean is they've taken a black line to certain names and incidences. So it really doesn't. So it just tells you there's a major cover up here. Right. Listen, the JFK, you know, like if anybody wants to watch the, you know, the, the if anybody wants to watch a, a great film on it, it, it really is JFK. Oliver Stone's by, by JFK. Stone. Yeah. Fantastic movie. It's a, it's a great movie. And that's basically uh, a DA, a district attorney in New Orleans believed that, you know, some of the clay Bertram or Clay Shaw, whatever name he went by, David Ferry and, and, and some of the actors in New Orleans that hung out with Oswald, he was going to arrest him for the murder of Kennedy because there was a woman that was dumped out of a car that came to him and said, they're going to kill the president. Right. And, and she was right. They did kill the president. So there was talk going around in, in the secret circles that that was going to happen. And so this didn't come out of the clear blue. Now, um, unfortunately, they were, the men were found innocent, but they're the only ones to be tried. Right. And for, a lot of that. But some of the evidence against them was also suppressed. Um, very much so. But I was going to mention um, Harry Connick Jr., mm -hmm. I believe, is actually the son of the. DA that does the prosecution. Interesting. I, I'd heard that somewhere. I could be wrong, hmm. but I'm almost positive. Jim Garrison was the guy's name. Jim Garrison? Yeah, Jim Garrison. And so Harry Connick Jr. I don't know. I heard they that. look alike. They do. Kevin Costner and Harry Connick kind of look alike. So I'll have to look into that. Somebody So we'll skip up forward a couple of years. I was say, so why why would Robert Kennedy not Say, why would he say the Warren Commission was okay? Why wouldn't he go nuts? Why well, wouldn't he? One of Robert Kennedy's campaign promises was he wanted to reopen the investigation to okay. his brother's murder. All right. And he believed, now you and I weren't alive then when he was campaigning, but according to my parents and other people, that, you know, he said there were questions that need to be answered, that the Warren Commission's report was inaccurate and it left wanting, you know, right. a lot to be desired. Uh, LBJ handpicked basically his friends or people he got along with or people that didn't like John F. Kennedy to make up that. It was just, it was just wrong from the start. Right. He found the, asked the wrong question to the wrong people and came up with the wrong conclusions. So, Bobby says, I'm going to reopen the investigation of my brother's murder. And then he run. He also runs for, he decides, if he, he decides he's going to run mm -hmm. to become the, uh, and doesn't he just become the Democratic Party's? Well, he's winning the nomination okay. in uh, June of, would it be 69, 68, 68. He just won California. And he said it's on to Chicago for, uh, I believe, Illinois primaries. Right. But he's winning. Yeah, yeah. And I think people now have realized that LBJ is a, a dud. Now, I just want to put my own conjecture in here. LBJ had the Great Society. Well, the Great Society wasn't that great. One of the things in his presidency was he ramped up Vietnam. And that was a war that we weren't trying to win, but we were just kind of stretch it out. Right. People hate Nixon, but at least Nixon sent to get people home. Right. You know, LBJ just continued the war machine over and over again. And he also made it for lower class families in his great society that you can't get welfare if you're married. Okay. So a lot of underprivileged and some black families. Mom and dad didn't stay together. Right, because it wasn't lucrative. Because you wouldn't get welfare. You wouldn't get government assistance. So there was, you know, fathers left the household. And I, this is my personal opinion, this is what really hurt our country because we had the divorce way with like 
blacks and whites in the United States in, in the mid 60s was like 77%, you know, or that were married. Right. And it went to like 40 something. The families didn't stay together after that in, in lower income houses because, I mean, if I can't get any assistance to right. feed my children, why would I stay married? Right. So, and I think that was a major gaffe, but LBJ didn't care about black people. Right. He said he did, but he didn't. And that's one of the big problems JFK had. That's how they were so opposite. So now you've got Robert Kennedy comes along. He's going to keep up with the civil rights work that his brother did that he so cared about and helping the poor and disenfranchised people in this country. He's a good looking guy. Doesn't look like a monster like Nixon or LBJ and one of those codger guys. And he's going to reopen the investigation of his brother. And he's also going to bring the boys home from South Asia, Southeast right. Asia. Well, and I want to tell a side story here that's really interesting. A young man won an essay contest in San Francisco or I forget what area, maybe greater LA area. And he got to go to the acceptance speech for the winner of the California primary, which was going to be at the uh, Beverly Hills Hotel. And it would end up being Robert Kennedy. So he set himself up since he won the contest. He set him, he sat on a freezer in the pantry in the walkway and he would get a chance to see the the winner of the primary walk by him, maybe shake his hand, get pictures. So the the young man, I even wrote his name down somewhere in here. Uh, Jamie Scott Bryant, I think is his name, or I uh, can't read my own handwriting. But anyway, it's okay. Jamie's 15 years old. He wins this contest. He's sitting in the pantry there. And he's got his camera with him. Very important to remember. So Robert F. Kennedy, it's late at night. He wins California. He says, it's on to Chicago. Walks uh, a side door into the pantry area to the kitchen. And he's going to leave the hotel. Rosie Greer, former Los Angeles, or maybe I think it was a current Los Angeles, bodyguard was his bodyguard big big nfl football player was his bodyguard okay and of course we we know what happens but i want to say this too colby doesn't know there was a colby, polish Col yeah. colby probably thinks he became president so <laughs> colby a polish national that worked for the toronto star happened to put his tape recording machine up on the dais where bobby spoke and said, you know, it's on to Chicago and it stayed running. And he forgot it was there until like a couple hours later. And he got that recording and he gave it to people that work on sound technology. And you can clearly hear 14 shots ring out 14. I think Sir Hand Sir Hand's gun only was like six or seven. I forget how it wasn't fourteen. That's the name of the guy that shot him, Sir, Sir Hand. Supposedly, Sir Hand Sir Hand. Sir Hand Sir. So what happens is Robert F. Kennedy walks around the corner and gunfire breaks out. Robert F. Kennedy, his aide, people in the pantry there. This is close quarters. It's like this room. There's a table in the middle and walk and then there's not much room, but everybody that was in that room, Matt, right. said Sir Han, Sir Han was never closer than four feet from Robert F. Kennedy. Okay. And he was always in front of him. I, All I, four I, shots. I didn't know anybody else got shot. I, I thought it was just Robert All Kennedy. All four shots that hit Bobby Kennedy were in the back of his head and in his back. Okay. I did not know that. The wound that killed him was so close. To the back of his head, it was stifling, like there was burn yeah. marks. Someone put the gun that close to the back of his head and pulled the trigger. Now, remember, again, Rosie Greer, his bodyguard, right. tackles Sir Hand Sir Hand about four feet in front of him to the ground. And there's obviously pictures, and they don't have that, you know, on moving pictures, but a lot of people 
there there is film right afterwards with a busboy holding Bobby Kennedy's in his arms, and you can see back in the main auditorium, people were, do we have a doctor in the house? Is there a doctor in here? Pandemonium breaks out. Right. So they try to get a doctor in there. Bobby's bleeding, but he's still conscious. Uh, Ethel's wife comes out to his side. They end up getting him out, getting him in an ambulance. Unfortunately, I believe he dies a day or two later in an L.A. hospital. Our young gentleman that won the contest that got to meet or see the president, right. the presidential hopeful, his film is confiscated by the FBI. And he said, as soon as Bobby walked in there, he started taking pictures and right. ended the whole row. And he never got his film back. He sued the FBI and won $100,000 or something like that. But again, they can't let evidence. That doesn't support the narrative. Doesn't that support, you know. And what's sad is, and people think Sirhan Sirhan was an MK Ultra candidate. I was going to say, what? Uh, I was going to say, what? What are your thoughts on the uh, Manchurian candidate? Manchurian candidate. I don't know. Supposedly, Do you know what that is? A Manchurian <laughs> candidate <laughs> is is the the CIA was working with people, giving them LSD. It's like surge. I can't tell you the whole acid, and they're trying to break people's will. <clears throat> To where they or hypnotize them to do whatever you want them to do. So a Manchurian candidate is uh, somebody who doesn't understand that he's been compromised. Yes. So you're if you if you had had you'd been dosed with LSD, D, you'd been brainwashed over been and over and over again, altered and then put back into society and told to run for president. So you run for president. Everybody helps you. You become president. And one day, all we have to do is somebody says to you, um, pink ponies love rainbows. And you immediately go, oh, oh my gosh. Or, yeah, you, or you immediately say, we need to go ahead and launch an invasion into um, North Korea immediately. And yeah. you're just like, what, what, what are you saying? Like, you've been pre-programmed to yeah. do something based on something. Now, yeah. Sirhan, Behavior Sirhan. modification with drugs, uh, sleep deprivation, however you can make a Manchurian candidate. Now, I have personally seen hypnotists that hypnotize people and they say, when I yeah, yeah. do this, you're going to go next door and steal a bagel. Right, you're going to act like a come duck. back with bagels and they wake up and they're pissed because they're like, yeah, right, or you're going to stole it. Yeah, you're going to be a you're you're going to be a duck. And next thing you know, they say something, they start walking around quacking like a duck. They, You've seen that, and you, so, it's all over YouTube. If you don't believe right. me, you can watch these. So, so people believe there was a girl in a polka dot dress. Yeah, that's the symbol, not a phrase, but a symbol. And they, when, when he saw her. would see her, he would get his gun out and shoot Bobby Kennedy. Right. The problem again. Is this in such a closed environment and so many people there? Now, Rosie Greer, now, he wasn't Jim Brown, but he was a pretty famous football player. And he was just adamant that Sirhan was never behind Kennedy. He was in front of him. And he, and Rosie's a big dude. I'm, Sirhan's a tiny little guy. Right. He, he, you know, he probably clubbed him like a baby seal yeah. when he realized what he was doing, you know? I mean, Sir Han had no chance. So they get the gun out of his hand. They're screaming pandemonium. They try to revive Bobby. Sir Han's obviously tried. But again, the cover up comes in. LAPD dug the bullets out of all the walls. Because again, Sir Han's gun only had X amount of bullets. They said, Oh, there was only X amount of shots. But now we know, like, that the Polish reporter working for the Toronto Star, we've got his recording. You can hear everything. It's amazing. And one of the things that... But the photos are the, gone. The, the, some of the photos are gone. But we know that Bobby, the death shot, 
He probably could have survived the other ones, but the one that killed him was someone put a gun right up right. behind him, behind his head. Now, I'm going to try to find it for you guys. But there's a lot of coverage on YouTube about the assassination of Bobby Kennedy. And one of them, it's a CBS camera is just rolling. You hear the screams and people are running around. Does anybody know a doctor? Does any, you know, right. have a doctor? And th that happens. And then it's the craziest thing, Matt. You see somebody come out of the pantry door and he's talking to his friend across the room and he goes, bang, bang, bang. Not right. bang, right. bang. He goes, bang, bang, bang. And to me, that spoke volumes. That guy was in there. He saw what went down. Now, the scary thing, Matt, is this is 1960s America. We already know with JFK's murder, if you tell any other story, you're dead. Right. I mean, dozens of witnesses to John F. Kennedy's assassination. One guy car flipped over. One guy in perfect health died of a heart attack. One guy suicided himself, you know. The, just astronomical odds of people that witness the same event end up dying within 48 hours. Right. It just doesn't happen. And people have heard these things about JFK. <clears throat> now, Bobby and people that were in there, they, they could not allow him to reopen a reopen the investigation in his brother's death. Right. What a can of worms that would open for the United States of America if it was learned that a former president had a hand in his boss's death or a former vice president had a hand, you know, right. or or the CIA or whoever. And you know, younger me would say, well, maybe they had reasons to do this, you know, maybe maybe Kennedy was selling us out to the Russian. No, no, no I don't believe that. I, but, I was just gonna say we we mentioned I mentioned it earlier. It was it was uh where that that interview with Putin mm -hmm. where they say, you know, do you are you concerned about the you know presidents of the United States or who's gonna be the next president? And he said it doesn't really matter. Yes. Because he said He's already been through what three presidents, mm -hmm. three or four presidents, and he was like, "Doesn't really matter." He's like, "Look, the presidents run on agendas. Mm -hmm. Then they get elected, they get into office." He said, and he he actually says like he's like men show up with briefcases. He said in gray suits. And he said like mine, and he kind of you know he said, but not he he's it's actually kind of funny. He goes, he said he said they typically don't. He goes, he said black oh, black suits or gray suits and a gray tie. He said not a red tie. Like he said, like I, I wear, but you know, he says all these, he's kind of de super descriptive on the suits, which is odd mm -hmm. is they show up, they sit down and they explain how things work. He said, think about it. He said, when Obama took office, he said he was going to, first thing he was going to do was close down um, Guantanamo Bay. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and he said, did he? He never did. He said, when and he starts naming all these different promises, he said that they could have shown up and with the stroke of a pen, this is done. That's it. Totally up to me. He said, but what happens is these men show up, they explain how things work, and then they allow them to continue going forward. He said, the next president comes in. He has all these things on his agenda. They walk in. They say, these are acceptable. These aren't. He said, because the presidents are figureheads and they don't really run. That's so things. funny you say that because I was, which was spooky, watching a, something about Area 51 uh, Groom Lake, where the UFOs and numerous presidents and senators have tried to figure out what's going on there. They yeah. don't have the clearance to get in there. Oh, listen, but, um, what was it? Trump said, I'll, he, he initially said he was going to, he would find out, he would let you know, he would this. And then he got in and he says, and during his son was, uh, as actually, um, interviewing him, he said, I, I would, I would like to tell you what I know is very interesting, he said, but, you know, he said, I'll, I'll, I'll think about it or something like that. Yeah. But he never says anything. Because Carter was a, uh, you supposedly saw Carter, a UFO. Yes, yeah, said he saw a UFO. Hillary Clinton was big on it. He and Bill wanted to talk about UFOs, but it's so funny. They all have this ideology. When I become president, 
I'll find this out. This is going to happen. I'm going to get the truth. You right. know, we're going to do this. Well, then you've got these guys in front of Congress saying, no, no, you don't understand. There's a whole secondary system that is outside of the purview of the president. Yes. So, so, uh, that that actually run these programs. And, sure. and you think about it. And the president the, has to have plausible deniability for certain things well, as well. Or, or does he even get to know, like, let's face it, maybe they just say, no, you're not allowed to know. And think about it. Think about it. the Pentagon has never successfully passed an audit. And it's not always like, oh, it's off by 11 million. It's off by billions. Like, Remember not- Donald Rumsfeld saying there's $3 trillion missing? Right. On September 10th, 2001. Right. And then and, boom. And then the area of the Pentagon that they were had doing the auditing got blown up on yes, September yeah, 11th. The next day. Listen, there was like, I want to say, and I could be off on the number. It was like $300 million flown in on like a DC something to uh, Iraq. Flown in on pallets. Disappeared. Where did that, we need that, man. Where did that go? Just disappeared. Like, and they're like, yeah, we don't know what happened. We took it off the plane. Why can't someone dump a pallet on the backyard here? I mean, I mean, like, how how does that disappear? How does it, it landed on a military base? How does it disappear? And they're like, yeah, it's just, and nobody, no huge investigation, no tracking it down, no video cameras, no, just gone. Yep. Like that's not, you know, n- not that the, not that the Federal Reserve couldn't just print up more money. Right. Or, but still the fact that even that you can track the fact that this money is missing tells you that a lot more has got to be missing. Absolutely. And it all comes down to how the president is a powerful person. But there's people that have been there in that job that help the president and they'll be there when he's gone and a new person sitting there right. to explain to them kind of what the rules are and how we do things here. And listen, listen, 10, well, let's say 15 or 20 years ago, like half the conversations I have now, mm-hmm. I would roll my eyes at You're right. the, the, my, the, the, the things that I believe now to me, 15 or 20 years ago, are would have been laughable. It's like, are you serious? Like, bro, aliens? Yeah. Like UFOs, are you joking? I got something good for you. One of the things that Kennedy did do when he was in office, he told our treasury to start printing money. Now, people don't understand that the Federal Reserve was hoodwinked. The Creature from the Jekyll Island is, is a great book to read right. about how they tried to do it with Taft, but he would had no go. But Woodrow Wilson was basically the one that allowed us to have a federal reserve, which is not federal and it's not a reserve. It's a centralized bank that basically tells our right. lawmakers, this is what the percentage is, is what the discount rate. Right. And, We're it, and loan it's, money. it's all set up and it's all set up to f- think about the name. Federal Reserve. Yeah. Well, then it's federal, right? No, no, it's not federal. It's like, oh, but the president chooses who runs the federal reserve no, no it doesn't they go to him with like five names that they've all been approved by the federal reserve they've agreed these five guys we're okay with mr president pick from one of these five because we're good with any of them mm-hmm. so you tell me did he elect it looks like he elected them it looks like he chose the guy oh i like this guy okay good we don't give a shit which one you fucking choose you don't really have a choice anyway. I mean, think about it. Who really runs it? It's the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, the city of London, the Vatican, the people that have been in power for hundreds of years that really run things. And so Kennedy tells our treasury. Now, that's our tr- where we mint our money. We, we do that for the Federal right. Reserve makes monetary policy, how much we can have. They basically print money and we borrow money from the Federal Reserve. Right. And then they might buy our T-bills. That, that So they're double dipping, you right. know, or they're selling us, they're buying and selling, you know, funds, discount. That's right. how they, the, it's open the, market operations, basically lower... The discount rate. I was it the fiat system the fi- that the banks course. run on what, is. And that's is, what it started. The fiat it, it's system. A, it's an illusion. To it, it's an illusion. It creates an illusion of security that is really not there. Right. But when Kennedy was still president, our money was still backed by gold and silver at the time. Right. So 
he had our, gold our treasury start printing money and they were red numbered money. So if you find a, a bill from pre-1963 with red numbering, that's called a Kennedy bill. There's not many of them out there, but he wanted to do away with the Federal Reserve. That'll get you killed in a heartbeat. Right. And yeah, Nixon pulled, took us off the, uh, the, the gold, gold standard. standard. Like, yep. There's so many things that, yeah. you know. And I know Trump wanted to do away with the, he wanted to talk about doing away with the, the Federal Reserve. Because again, it's not federal, it's not a reserve. We don't control our own money supply. And Thomas Jefferson said, if America doesn't control its money supply, it's doomed. And now we're talk we're hearing about a digital dollar coming in the future because it's like Matt says, it's fiat money. It has it's money that has no intrinsic value in of itself. Now, it used to be that this this note is it worth this much in gold or silver, like the British pound sterling. That's why they call it because it's worth sterling silver. The the, the pound pound note was. So, yeah. Do, you, do it, you know how easy it is to open a bank? Open a bank? Have you ever really looked into it? Like, it is, it is, it's, it's, I mean, it's not easy. Like the guy, the guy that works at Tire Kingdom can't open one. But if you had a few million dollars, you can open a bank. Yeah. You really, you, because what happens is all you have to do, because each state has its own banking policies, right? So you open a bank in Florida, you can then turn around and, and, and it's easy, like, for instance, you go to the Department of Banking Finance and they'll say, well, look, you need $5 million. You can put in half the money, raise half the money. You need a physical location, which, by the way, the physical location has to meet certain guidelines. Or you can have an offshoot of a physical location, which means you could have a parent bank like Bank of America can represent you. So you can basically have your bank can be in like a strip mall. So you have a little strip mall bank. You don't have anything. Right. You, you're just a parent company. You're just an offshoot. You have a parent company like Bank of America to represent you. You pay them a small fee. And then you only have to have like the the people that run the bank only have to have a few years experience in banking. So now you're a state bank. So if I have a couple million dollars, I can raise the rest of the money from, from selling stock sure. in the company. So now I'm a bank. Now I become a bank. And I can, I'm under the umbrella of a larger bank like Bank of America, and you don't have to stay that way, but you can. Um, and then once you've, you're a state bank, you can then apply to become an FDIC insured bank. So you actually have state banks that are small local state banks, like credit unions, right. things like that. Sure. Then you can become a federally insured bank, an FDIC insured bank by the federal level, but you don't have to. You don't have to do that, but you can. And all you have to do to have that is you have to meet the Federal Reserve requirements, which is really almost identical to most of the states, which is some of the people that run the bank have to have so many years in experience running banks. And most of these bank presidents. So if you were a bank president of another bank, you can be the bank president, by the way, of multiple banks. So I just go to you and say, I'll pay you this much to qualify us to become a federal, an FDIC insured bank. And now I get to borrow money from, from the, the Fed. Federal Reserve. Yeah, absolutely. My I dad's friend opened First United Bank and in Boca Raton, it did really well at a couple branches. He got bought out. I think Wachovia or someone bought out a year later. Yeah, a lot They of didn't keep the name. He opened the brand new bank, First United, same name and everything. Grew that, sold that bank. It used to, when I looked into it, it was like, you literally could do it for like, it was like two and a half, a, 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 a bank in Florida for like two and a half million. So you only had to have like a million and change. Yeah. Like, I'm sure it's higher now. That's why I was saying uh, two and a half million, like whatever it is now, I don't know. But back then it was ridiculous. And I only knew that because a guy that I, um, a, a mortgage company, a lending company I was dealing with came to me one day and said, would you be interested in buying it stock in this bank that we're that we're opening? And I was like, what do you mean? And he said, yeah, we're going to open a bank. He said, that way we can start borrowing money directly from the Federal Reserve. And I went, you can't just open a bank. You're, you're a lender, which only required $250,000 in reserves. To be a, a, a correspondent lender, you had to have like 50,000 in reserves, which is what I had. And, and, and only 10,000 of that had to be liquid. So my company only had to be worth like 40,000. Wow. And I had to have 10,000 sitting there. And now I'm a correspondent lender. So 
I'm going over all this. And he explained the whole thing, pulled the pamphlets out, everything. And I remember going, this is insane. Yeah. For a cup for less than $2 million. And you think you fractional lending. I mean, seriously. And then he was explaining, he started explaining borrowing money to lend to people and getting a mortgage. And then have it once you have that mortgage, you can use that as collateral to borrow additional. Fu- you borrow like 10 times the amount of mortgage. I'm like, that doesn't even make sense. He's like, I know. If bro. you got Ten thousand dollars physically in your bank, you can loan a hundred thousand dollars on it. Yeah, because you get screwed. Because it's all digits and you know pluses and zeros. It's the analog system. People, don't, they don't not. You know, if I send my right Kobe a ten thousand dollar check to his bank. They're not moving ten grand over. It just shows. It's, right. it's crazy. But but it's the crazy. Fed will lend you if you have if you have something of value of ten thousand dollars. They'll allow you to lend a hundred thousand. That's the fiat system. Mm-hmm. And, and so, okay, so now if I lend that money and get mortgages, use that money to open up mortgages, and now I own the possession of those mortgages mm-hmm. are valued at the 100000 Now I have $100,000. Can I now borrow a million? Of course you can. What are you talking about? You're continuing to lend me money based on instruments that you're helping me create. In the end, my bank is worth very little money. You see what I mean? It's, mm-hmm. You're not worth a whole lot. Like you're letting, continually lending me on the same money. The mm-hmm. principle that you're setting forth, the underwriting guidelines you're setting forth, you're helping me to create. I don't actually have any of this money. Yep. So that's why that, that's why a lot of these banks, like they can't let them go under. Right. Because the domino effect would be horrible. horrible. Yeah. They're, they call too big to fail. And you know, that. Again, get, getting back to Kennedy, he saw major problems in the whole banking institution, and he had us print our own money, and that had to be the biggest slap in the face to the powers that be that really run the show. I want to mention one more kind of conspiracy theory, and that's John F. Kennedy Jr. and that flight that crashed off Martha's Vineyard. Right. And what people don't realize is, is Ted Kennedy went to Clinton – and had to beg him to get the, our Coast Guard out there looking for that plane. Okay. Because they dragged their feet. And people think, yeah, that's because Hillary Clinton was worried about John F. Kennedy Jr., who was a good-looking young guy. Getting you know, the nomination? You know, she was a New York senator. You know what I'm saying? And he was looking for her job, possibly the presidency. Oh, okay. And he was going to be a serious political foe. Of Hillary, you know, which was late 90s, early 2000s back then. So, you know, John F. Kennedy, you know, his plane crashed just uh, off Martha's Vineyard. Right. But they, they waited hours and hours to do any search. And Ted Kennedy, when he was still alive, had to go to Bill Clinton and beg him to, to order the Coast Guard to go look for that plane. Uh, he he had taken a plane out. He was a, a pilot, but he wasn't he wasn't um, certified to fly the plane simply by. He was the, only sight rated, not instrument rated. Yeah, he wasn't instrument rated. So when he went out and it was night, he became disoriented and the plane crashed. You know, supposedly. But that's once, what they tell us. Yeah. And the sad thing is, oh, it's, we only know by what they tell us. Yeah. His fiance was with him, and his. Was it his fiance's fiance? sister? I and think, his, right? And her sister. Yeah. Was, uh, you know, like at the last minute, like the sister was going to come with them. Like, oh, how fucking horrible. Yeah. Um, terrible. So, yeah, it's a, a, it's a, it's a, it's a trial that, that the whole family is just a family with tragedy. Now, Ted Kennedy, the, the third brother, I've heard some interesting stories about him. The Chappaquiddick. Mary Jo Kopechny was a girl that worked in the Kennedy campaign and, her body was found in where a bridge had, I guess what you'd say, there was no more bridge. The bridge had worn out, washed away, and her body was found in the back seat. And supposedly, the, the story was that Ted and her were driving away. And Ted saved himself, didn't get her out of the right. car. Supposedly, he was drunk. So that was and he kind of drives story. off the yeah. He drives off the bridge. But I, I read a book about a young couple that said. We were at the bed and breakfast that Ted was staying at, and we know it was Ted because we talked to him every morning. He was in great mood, but someone came in that morning at eight, and and he was like, oh, my gosh, left. 
And so people are now thinking that Ted was actually having an affair with Mary Jo because that night, one of the local cops shined the light in the car and Ted and Mary Jo was in there. And they think that they were in the stepping of out of marriage yes. vows there. Yeah. And so after they were done, Ted got out of his car, went back to with his wife. She didn't realize the, the, the bridge was out, got killed there. But Ted has to explain what he was do, you know, doing with Mary Jo at 1030 at night. And his saying was, he said, yeah, I was just driving her back because we had the fundraiser out there in Martha's Vineyard. So he had to explain his whereabouts. And he's kind of between a rock and a hard place. He either admits he's having an affair, which is going to ruin his chance for president, right. or that he was driving and, and drunk and and couldn't get to Mary Joe, had to save himself. Right. Which so then by the time they con they he, they call the police and everything, he sobered up. So he doesn't yeah. appear that he's drunk. He but, basically. But, but there's a lot of people that are now coming out saying that they saw. Him get the news the next morning, and he was shocked, like his face turned white. And they said he wasn't in that car the night before. Who he was just right? having an affair on his wife, right. and he found out the next morning that she Could died. Have been both. Could have been both. You never know. I always assumed he was he was banging the chick. Yeah, you know, and that he got drunk and went off. Like I, 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 I yeah, she, of, yeah, right. And and obviously he wasn't able to run for president. He stayed. He was a senator, and he just yeah. stayed a senator until. But he, he was died. a powerful senator, much like Lyndon Baines Johnson, for years, or Mitch McConnell, if he can stay awake, right. So what's uh, what's what's next? What's going on? I don't what's, know. Are we are are we wrapping this up? I you know, I think we we could. How long, how long we got? <laughs> two hours and thirty minutes. Oh man! Okay, huh. I promise you. There's other rabbit holes we can go down. But, <laughs> um, I think that people need to understand. There's guys like Gerald Posner that have written books that it was Oswald and he acted alone. Right. Well, guess what? I'm not saying he's an agent for the CIA, but he's a shill that's been paid a lot of money to tell the story and tell it this way. And if you hear any other story or that basically says Oswald was the shooter, it's just impossible, man. Right. It's well, just impossible. What about He might have known, but he wasn't the shooter. What about the Secret Service agent that just recently came out with a book? Well, he's, he basically said that he found the pristine bullet, you know, uh, Evidence number 399 in the Warren Commission, the pristine bullet, that he found it on the back of the limousine and he put it on the gurney because he said, well, I just felt like uh, it needs to be near the body. Now, any agent worth the salt would know which gurney the president had been laying on because the nurses had cleaned it up and they found no bullet there. Right. Okay. So the other idea it on, that it just falls out yeah, of his body. Well, and it's basically been said that it fell out of Connolly's leg and it's a pristine bullet with no blood on it. And, right. But he's saying this now to say that, yeah, the magic bullet theory is not true because this bullet I found laying on top of the car. It's not something that fell out of Connolly, but I just put it in there. You know what he should have done it and bagged. If that's true, it bagged it and tagged it. It's put in the evidence. Now you have to understand Clint Hill, the man that they think he was in love with Jackie O. I mean, they would share cigarettes. She loved Evan Clint because she was a secret smoker. And, uh, the, the gentleman here, Paul Landis, Landis. The, these were people that were assigned, Hill and Landis were both assigned to the Kennedy family. Clint Hill was not one of the nine agents out drinking, but Landis was. Okay. He was one of the guys that went out the night before and got drunk. These guys have changed their stories over the years. Oh, no. The, initially, they all wrote in their reports, the fire came from in front of us. Right. Then all of a sudden, two months later, no, the fire was behind us. And then initially, and there, when the fire was in front, we could smell the cordite. We could see the smoke. We could see muzzle flash. And then it was, no, we just heard it. We didn't smell anything. 
So these guys have changed their stories over the years so many times, Matt. Can you believe them? And like I was saying to you guys earlier, if someone's going to give me a $300,000 advance to write a book. Right. What do you want me to say? Yeah, what do you want it to say? What do you, what do you, what do you want me to say? <laughs> you know? Yeah. It beats mortgage fraud, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um. All right. Are we... Are we good? Uh, we're good. Listen, we're, we're, we're going to have the 60th anniversary of uh, JFK. It's coming November. Sadly, we just had the 55th anniversary last June of RFK. There's going to be more talked about it in the news. So I think this is a timely podcast. But I just encourage everybody. There's a lot of information on YouTube to where you can see it yourself. Make up your own mind. Look at the evidence. Look at the Zapruder film. Watch. Listen, I honestly, I still, the JFK movie with. Uh, Excellent. With uh, Kevin Costner and it, um, Oliver Stone. It's very entertaining it's, and it's very educational yeah. because he goes through frame by frame in the Zapruder film. Yeah. And that film wasn't out until 1975. <laughs> Matt's going to remember. Geraldo Rivera first came in our life because he had Al Capone's secret vaults. Remember oh, yeah. that? Yeah. Like in the early 80s, and they couldn't wait to open the vaults to see what Al Capone had stashed. It was a big bag of nothing, okay? But Geraldo Rivera in the, in the 70s got a hold of the Zapruder film, and he's one of the first people to show the Zapruder film to the national audience. That had to wake a lot of people up. And that had to make a lot of people in Washington, D.C. nervous. Uh, Geraldo was huge there for a while, wasn't he? Yeah. He was huge. He had a couple of disappointing shows. Yeah. He was big on hype. Yeah. You might have wanted to open that safe first. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Let me take a look. What's in there? I sat and I watched the whole thing, Matt. <laughs> for nothing. <laughs> but, you know, he, he brought out the Zapruder film. So, he had some, you know, he had some clout that, 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 you know, that helped him. Who got their nose broken? Yeah, he got punched. Oh, yeah, yeah. He got punched yeah. on that. He had kind of like a Jerry Springer type style show. show yeah. For a while there. Yeah. And and actually just got punched right in the face. Just yeah. Bam. I mean, like blood, the whole thing. Hilarious. I, I forgot about that. That's true. Yeah, he's been around. But we had some good shows. We had the Morton Downey Jr. show back then. A lot of these people, and they would put a neo-Nazi with, you know, P, uh, with the Black the, Panther Black or something. Pan, and, and, and I believe a neo-Nazi is the one that punched Geraldo Rivera. Yeah. <laughs> Never ended up. It was well. crazy. This was back when Oprah, Oprah was, uh, you know, uh, interviewing, you know, uh, um, midgets or, or, you know, little people, dwarfs so yeah. that uh, had sex with their, you know, uh, it, it, chiropractors or whatever. You know, it was like, it was just. She know, wasn't giving out dishwashers. No, she, she was. Uh, yeah, this is when she first started. It was like, oh, these are horrible. <laughs> but as she became more popular, she was able to slowly like, okay, we're done with the dwarfs. I okay. actually was on the Oprah show. Did I ever tell you that? No. <laughs> are you serious? I'm dead serious. For what? My, my brother was an organ donor and he died. Oh, okay. And Sorry. the lag, my last conversation with my brother was about. ESPN did a story called Ray of Hope. And it was about this guy, Jason Ray, who was the mascot for University of North Carolina. He wore the Ramsey's outfit in his divine providence. He was in North Jersey. He had the rare blood type and he's six, five. So he's got, there's, there's three gentlemen that are all big. They have the rare blood type and they need an organ. Unfortunately, he goes out to get a, a sandwich gets hit by a hit and run car. He's dying. His mom, Emmett and Charlotte back in North Carolina, they get the horrible phone call that nobody wants, but basically your son's dying. He doesn't have any brain activity, but he's an organ donor. We want your blessings. And those men, one guy got his heart. And so Emmett and Charlotte got to listen to their son's heart and some other person's chest. Another guy got his liver and one and two other there were four men total one got his pancreas and the other got his kidneys because he was in liver fa a kidney failure and so espn got these men together to meet jason ray's mom and dad and i was blown away when i was 16 years old and i got my driver's license my brother made me sign up to be an organ donor 
And I was like, what? I, all I remember was Monty Python, live organ donor. And I was right. like, organ donor? What do you mean? He's like, trust me. You can't take it with you. Right. And it's a good thing. So my brother, when he passed away, his eyes were donated, skin and all that. They flew the body for free. And it's just an amazing thing. You know, there are people that are burn victims or people that have no vision. Right. It's just a, the last selfless, great, beautiful act you can do before you died. But it, that Jason Ray show, because that's my last conversation with Dan, my brother, that I ever had with him. I was like, dude, you got to watch this right up your alley, Dan. The guy's an organ donor. And I feel bad for his mom and dad. It was terrible. So I wrote ESPN a letter thanking them. Because that show was healing to me and my family. And they put me in touch with Emmett and Charles of Ray. So I'm emailing them back and forth. And then when they went on the Oprah Winfrey show, I was kind of like that other guest that came up, you know. Oh, and by the way, we know you've been talking to this young man, David Wilhauer in South Florida, who okay. lost his brother. And I, and I came on the Oprah show. And she asked me two questions. The first question, I did great. The second one, I was reading on the teleprompter and had the greatest answer. And she asked me a different question, and I didn't do so well, Matt. <laughs> but I've got it. It's uh, January 31st, 2008, Dr. Oz's Medical Miracles. And I was on the Oprah show. It was pretty cool. All right. We'll and play uh, that. Maybe, maybe yeah. we can play that. It's a lot, a lot of plans. Well, I'll send it to you. Okay. Okay. But uh, yeah, you can see me a lot skinnier back then. But uh, but yeah, she, she, beloved woman, Oprah Winfrey. Not now, you, bro. Yeah, I know. She was back then. <laughs> I think she might have taken a trip to Lila, Lolita Island. I don't know. But she, lo you know, she loved your boy here. She kept giving me hugs up on stage. And so my girlfriends I went to college with, they're like, she loved you. I was like, I'm telling you, Oprah loved me. And we're getting <laughs> pictures behind. And my dad's like, we got a plane to catch. And I'm like, Oprah's talking to me. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So. All right. We went from Horal to Rivera to my Tell brother's. Uh, that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. It's good stuff. Yep. All right. I'm going to thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. And you're going to take me to lunch now. Yeah, absolutely. And let me wrap this up. All right. Hey, I appreciate you guys watching the uh, the video. Do me a favor. Hit the subscribe button. Share the video. If you like videos like this and you want to get notified, hit the bell. Leave a comment in the comment section. And I really appreciate it. And we're going to leave a link. Let's leave a link because Colby doesn't have anything else to do. Let's leave a link in the description to uh, the JFK movie we talked about. I'm telling you, this is a great movie. The and, Pruder film. And there's a Pruder film. Well, I mean, Colby might. might well, try to put that in somewhere. We should probably try and put that in somewhere. If not, we'll try and leave a link Even the to Bobby, the assassination of Bobby Kennedy. There's a lot of cameras that were left on and you can see what I was talking about. Okay. We'll try and figure something out. I appreciate you guys watching. Thank you much. Thank you much. Thank you very much. See ya. Dave, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> I got a little story to tell you. I know. So you contacted me. Mm -hmm. You said, hey, man, listen, I knew this guy. He was a con man. This is an insane story. It and is. then we talked on the phone a couple of times. And you like you're not obviously the con man, but you were you ended up living with this guy. and You were friends with him for how long? I lived with him for six months. Right. And, and I saw kind of watch the whole thing unfold. I saw the tragic end when he skipped town in the end. But we'll get to that. And but I I just saw the way he manipulated people, and it's a pretty amazing story. And it's and this guy had known these people for six seven years, so it's not like some guy that just came in someone's life, right? But he was a con man, right. so and he was setting them all up on what, a long con. What happened? Like how? Like hey, one? Did you ever find out? Like you know, uh, had he ever done this before? He'd done it before, right? And then what? So then he comes into town. And he he. he Starts over. He moves to Florida. Where he had he lived before? Cleveland, Ohio. And he'd done it in Cleveland. Yes. What had he done there? He had just ripped a basic... people off about over $150,000. Okay. 
and his parents had to pay to make the people whole. All right. So he, and moved, then he moves. moved to Florida, works for a commercial fisherman for a while. Then he gets a job with AB and AMRO. That's the amalgamated bank of Amsterdam, Rotterdam. They're like the fourth or fifth largest bank in the world. LaSalle Bank, if you're familiar with them out of Chicago. Okay. I'm not. Um, I hear well, you. they were big back in the day. When was this? 2005. You're okay. about to start your adventure, and I was going on a little adventure of my own there. So uh, it's 2005. I had just shattered my femur, fallen off a roof. I'm, I'm a former financial advisor. Who does roofing. That Well, I wasn't really a roofer. I had, a, you were just, I had another way to make some money. I had friends that paint. Okay. So I was, I was painting thinking. a roof. I wasn't right. actually a roof, and I've said that. I had a guy that I used to work with at Payne Weber, UBS, UBS Payne Weber, said, I need my roof painted. The homeowners insurance association's coming after me. So, make a long story short, I gave him a quote. I didn't hear from him. Six months later, I come back. The tile breaks. I fall. I shatter my femur. I'm learning to walk again. God. And so, I was just going to the racetrack, basically, at the Palm Beach Kennel Club. So you're not working. Not working. Staying with mom and dad. Right. Mom taking care of me. And let me tell you something. And, when you wake up, right. see the beautiful sunrise, your body heals faster. They lived on the beach. It was great. So this is spring training, 2005. My buddy, Jeff Cox, we call him Coxie. Uh, I've known him for years. He said, hey, I'm going to bring Paul LaDuca by. One of, he's a new Marlin. He got traded the year before to come up and hang out with us. So I'm hanging out with Paul and Coxie. And there was this guy sitting in the corner, kind of kept to himself, had a bag of pens in his racing form. And, and slowly but surely, once Paul, especially after Paul's wife went back to San Antonio, we were there Thursday night, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. In a Major League Baseball, you have to play about five innings, and then you can leave. And Paul had horses that he owned at the time, so he would drive from Jupiter to West Palm Beach and watch them run. So I'm having a blast just hanging out with these guys, especially when they make $8 million a year. Right. And hanging out with Coxie and Paul. And so this guy sitting in the corner didn't bug us, really played it cool. And that's what a con man needed to do, kind of worked his way in. But we noticed he was a pretty good handicapper. He would pick some winners, and if he won, he would buy us a round of drinks. And I, not that I'm an extra an expert, but in my life, I've noticed if you want to be friends with a celebrity or be cool, don't ask him for anything. Don't ask for autographs. Don't be annoying. Uh, they want to be buy treated like something. A- yeah, you know, just they want to be treated like a regular dude, right? And so, I used to be a sports agent. And I had to, we would go to the second floor in this little cubbyhole cafe because I wanted to keep Paul away from, I hate to call him riffraff, but a lot of the people in the kennel club, they're just brutal. And, you know, they're probably Mets or Yankees fans and they're giving Paul grief because he plays for the Marlins. And I remember one guy saying, hey, LaDuke, I didn't know you're so short. And he'd say, yeah, but when I stand in my wallet, I'm a lot taller than you. Right. So, so anyways, time goes on and. We just befriend this guy. He said, his name's Dave. David Scott Srail. My name's David Scott Wilhauer. Hey, that's nice. He's a, from Cleveland, Ohio. I'm from Michigan. So he's a Buckeye. I'm a Wolverine. But he was just a super nice guy. And so then Paul was talking to him. Coxie's talking to him. So he kind of joined our little group for that month and a half every weekend in the spring of 05. So, about April, Coxie and Paul, well, you know, the big club's going to go play at the old pro player stadium where the Dolphins play now. They've since moved to downtown Miami, but the Marlins played right out on the, right by Calder race course. And so, we we're, I was thinking, hey, I'm going to go uh, to the racetrack and then I'll go see boys play baseball. And, and Dave's like, hey why don't you come move in with me and get a job where I work? And I was like, well, what do you do? He's like, well, it's a, it's a mortgage company. He's like, you'd be great selling mortgages. Like, man, I don't know anything about mortgages. He's like, listen, you start out as a temp. And then 
eventually, if you do really well, they'll hire you on full time. I started as a temp. I make great money there. He said, you'd be great selling mortgage. If you were a stockbroker, you could be a mortgage broker. He's like, then you'll be close to your buddies down there. Right. And so when I say down there, it's about 50, 60 miles south of where we're at. So, and I didn't have any other options at the time. And this guy was offering to let me live in his house on the beach. Right. And I, at first I was like, is he all right? Right. But he was like, no, nah, he, was, he was a pretty cool dude. And so I uh, eventually, I, I remember talking to Paul about it and he's like, yeah, the guy's straight, you know, why not? Just take, take him up on the offer. Can't hurt. So I interviewed, I got the job at AB and AMRO and I was selling second loans and HELOCs, home equity lines of credit. Right. And their full-time people do first mortgages. Every once in a while, it's a call center. I forgot to mention that. It's inbound calls. So all you're doing is taking calls all day long. Right. And so it's like if you made, if I made commission on it, I'd be making silly money. But they paid me 15 bucks an hour. And I've got to prove to them that I'm good enough to work full time. Right. So, and it was going great. And then like Dave would pay, we'd go out to dinner, he'd pay. I'm thinking this guy's rolling. Right. He must be really doing well, but he works in the, he didn't, he didn't sell loans. He did the, uh, quality uh, control, uh, processor. Yeah. In the processing. Okay. He works in the processing department. And so, but he drove a, a nice convertible BMW and his house was right on Arizona street. And Hollywood Beach. It was a little two bedroom place. I mean, it needed some work, but it was a really cool place because you know what they say about real estate the three most important things are location, location, location and location. location. And this guy's 600 yards from the waves, right? Right down on the beach. So it was a great location. So I'm living with my new friend working there, and I end up doing really well. I was writing like 250 second loans or home act lines of credit a month. Nice. That's at, but again, I'm getting calls and I've got a lot of them are LaSalle or Amy and Amro customers. So their information comes up there. And so I'm just filling in the blanks. Some people you had to turn them away. They're, they got 5.25% and they want to refinance at five and you have to explain to them with closing. It just doesn't make sense yeah. with closing costs. So now, in the end, I was thinking, I don't think he wanted him to do well, but we'll get to that. I, I mean, I don't think he wanted me to do well, and we'll get that figured out later on. I'll get you guys' opinion on that because he had scams that he was working on, but I didn't know it at the time. Right. So at AB and AMRO, everybody would go out in the smoker's alley. I didn't smoke, but I just had to take a break because my back, my hip, blah, blah, blah. And I'd see him talking to people, but Everybody was Dave's friend at the office. This guy, everybody loved him. And I remember one night, I think it's May, I'm waiting for him at the quarter deck to have dinner. I'm like, where, dude, where are you? Someone's car didn't start. He stayed on behind to help him. He was that dude at the office. Right. That helped the little old ladies. Hey, he'll help you move. He'll, he'll stop help you move. Yeah. He was Paint. that guy. And I was like, this guy's unbelievable. He, you know, I know nobody's perfect. And he showed some of his other qualities that weren't great. But, you know, he's just a human being like the rest of us. So I remember he, he told me that a girl that he used to date, Avelina, he introduced her to Travis. Travis is, is a mortgage broker. Avelina works in the office near him. And they're good friends. And they're they work at, at AB and AMRO there. And I had mentioned something about watching the Kentucky Derby because that's my thing. I'm in a horse racing. And Dave said, hey, at work, don't mention horse racing. At least don't include me. I'm like, why? He's like, eh, people have, you know, they think it's degenerate gambling, whatnot. He's like, so please don't, don't say anything about me and, horse racing and whatnot. He's like, just tell him to go antiquing. I'm like, 
there's no chance I'm going to tell anybody I'm going antique. Right. But he's like, well, just keep my name out of it. I thought that was weird. People don't, people don't want to give gamblers money. Right. To invest. Exactly. <laughs> but Avelina would give Dave like 300 bucks and he'd go to the antique shows and bring her back 400. I would later find out that was what was going on. Right. So he's building up trust with the people at work. Like, hey, I'm hitting this antique show. If you guys want to invest, and he paid them all back and then some, they made a nice little score with him. So he's building credit with all these people at work. Now, I don't know this. I just think it's Travis and Avelina. But I, I just remember he was really upset when I said it's Kentucky Derby because that same week's my birthday. That's like my favorite week of the year. And so I just remembered, wow, that's the first time I saw him kind of get mad at me. I was like, I was like, all right, bro, just, I'm not going to tell him I'm going antiquing. Right. So, if it works going fine, I'm, I'm doing well. I'm progressing there. I remember one day he had a Friday off and my car wouldn't start. And he said he was going antiquing. Right. <laughs> I was like, all right, knock yourself out. I'll see you later. We'll meet at the bar, you know, something like that. And I called my uncle and he's like, I'll come down, jump you. And he's got to drive like 45 miles. He's the only person I could find. One of the lifeguard friends of ours that we play poker with at night says, hey, I'll give you a jump start. So I called my uncle back and said, hold off. He said, I'm still going to meet you. Meet me at Pep Boys. We got to get you a new battery. If the weather turns hot. Batteries go bad. So it's turn enough, jump start. But when I turn the car off, wouldn't restart. Needs a new battery. I drive meet my uncle i come back and in florida in the east coast you have intercoastal waterways and you've got to go over the bridge to get back because we lived you know the ocean side of the intercoastal and i remember driving by dania highlight because that was just the way back to the house and i saw dave's car sitting there at like 11 o'clock in the morning okay and i thought that's weird maybe his antiquing got done early but what's he doing there now, they show simulcast racing from Australia and England and all that. So I'm like, oh, that guy's junking out betting the ponies. Right. So when I called him later, he pretended like he was still antiquing. I was like, when we say antiquing, we mean. I mean, like a, a, going, a, 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 buying, antiquing. So you think he's really going antiquing. I well, thought I antiquing th was code for, hey, yeah, I'm at the races. Yeah, exactly. So when you say antiquing, you're saying he, you really think he was going antiquing? He, he was trying to tell me he was <clears throat> antiquing. I'm thinking he's going to the racetrack. I don't care. Right. My problem with, there was I caught him in a lie. Right. And you don't need to lie to me. Tell me, yeah, dude, I'm betting Royal Ascot. It's showing it. Yeah. Great. Yeah, there's no reason, you, to, no reason to lie to me. And I just thought that was funny that he's trying to sell one over on me on a Friday that he didn't have to go to work. And, and you're just, living with him. Yeah, and I'm living with right. him. And I just thought that was really odd. Okay. Because he finally came up with the story. Oh, no, I did go antique, you know, because what he would say he would do, his brother has Ken Srail, has an antique and stamp company. So it's one of those things he knows all about it, living vicariously through his brother. So right. giving his brother's line out there to people like he's an expert at it. And I'm sure Dave grew up. He knows the antique business a little bit. We did have some pieces where he had some pieces in the house there. He's like, don't set your drink on that table. That's worth about $1,000. Right. You know, I was like, oh, you know. So he knew his stuff. And so, but he didn't need to lie to me when all he had to say was, yeah, I'm done. I got done antique, you know, looking at antiques because what he was saying he was doing was he would go to these sales and he knew rich, wealthy people. That we're looking for something. So if he find the piece, he would just play middleman and broker it and make a couple hundred dollars. So that's what he was doing when Avelina was giving him three hundred dollars. He was just going to the racetrack and yeah. just even if he lost, he was just giving her more money to build up credit. But what he told them he's doing is he's buying pieces and flipping them basically. Right. So when I say antiquing, like flipping antiques to make money. Okay. So that was the only really thing that ma made me hesitate early on he did the same thing for my parents my parents gave him a thousand bucks 
he said, yeah, I've got some, some antiques that I'm going to go buy in Miami. And he left one day, came back, said, here's 1400 bucks for your mom and dad. You know, I was like, wow, that's an easy way to make 40% on your money yeah. pretty fast. And again, that builds credibility. And so, you know, he would give me grief about the music that I listened to. And I just like this guy named Josh Rouse because I met him. But I like Van Halen and U2, and those are my bands. But he wanted to play Counting Crows. But I remember he would just needle me like, let's listen to Josh Rouse. Let's, you know, just make fun. Of so it's not like he was perfect Mr. Cool. He would yeah. be a goofball. He could ball. be a douchebag. Right? Yeah. And he could act like a douchebag. But, and I was like, hey. I remember saying, hey, at least I'm the one, the metrosexual guy everybody's questioning about. And he goes in his room and he comes out. This is Jen. That's my ex fiance. She died of cancer. And I felt like a shit bag. I mean, <laughs> he's like, well, is it true? I doubt it. <laughs> okay. But I mean, he's, but he's definitely time, got his, I'm like, oh, he's got pictures of her. He's got a whole he's story got his, about her. And I'm like, oh, I can't believe I did that. So he's got his con game down. I'm like, oh, Dave, put your foot in your mouth. I remember I walked outside and he's like, bro. He's like, you're a dick, but it's okay, man. You're not the first one. I was like, hey, as long as you're not going to come come hop in my bed at night, I don't care. You know, right. So we just played it. We're dudes, you know, we're yeah. playing it off. I said, I just, you know, we got all these hot chicks around here. He's like, man, I just can't get, I can't get Jen out of my head. <laughs> and I said, I understand. You poor tortured soul. And Let I, me invest in some <laughs> antiques. <laughs> and what's crazy is I had been engaged. July of oh two, spent a good seven grand at Wilderness Lodge, and twenty days later I was unengaged, and that's because I loved her dearly. We just weren't in love, right? And you know, if I hadn't proposed, we'd probably still be dating. You know, it's one of those things we just had to do something and just cut the cord and be done. She right. and I are still dear friends, but uh, so I was. It was kind of weird. I had always had a serious girlfriend. I was kind of playing the field and, and I'm in a new territory and it was just kind of weird in the, the, the bar rats. That's not really my, my scene there. Cause there's plenty of girls that be intoxicated and Dave's like, bring one home. I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that. It's just, that's never been my deal. And I was like, why don't you bring one home? And then, you know, that's kind of what precipitated the whole thing. So he explains to me back in Cleveland, he got engaged, this high school sweetheart, Jen, developed cancer, and just, he took care of her. She went downhill. And so he came to Florida, worked on a fishing boat, and then just need a new break. And I was like, you know, that was six years ago, but it was still obviously really bothering him. <laughs> so I had to mention my buddy, Matt, who I went to college with. And he bed section eight apartments and houses and he bought stuff. And he's like, you know, as a senior management at AB and AMRO, we've got a bunch of foreclosures. He said, Matt would have to be partners with me, but there's, we got a whole portfolio of foreclosures and we get first dibs on them. And so I get him on the phone with my Not college. exactly how it works, but yeah, okay. well, but you don't know any, better. I didn't know right. any better at the time. And he's got the appraisals on company letterhead. We go and look at the houses. Right. He's like, here's one in Pembroke Pines. It's a 2-2. Two, two. Um, you know, I think the company has got 38 invested into it. If we, you know, so I didn't know any better. And I'm talking to Matt. And Matt's one of those guys. He's, he did well for himself, but. He thinks he's smarter than he is. Right. And his brother and I used to go, hey, Matt, we've given you our knowledge. You've chose to disregard it. So good luck. You know, he's one of those guys. All right. So anyway, Matt ends up sending him like 30 grand. But I really didn't stay that in tune with that. I just knew that Matt had bought a couple houses. And they were looking at a third. 
Now, understand, I go to the racetrack with this guy all the time, but he's not whipping out five, ten grand. That's right. something my my baseball buddies do. You know, he's just he's betting pretty moderately here. But I do remember him playing a pick six, and he lost in the last race, and the look on its face was like someone died. Like he really needed the horse to win. I was like, oh man. And come to find out, it was like if he would have hit, it would have been like two or three hundred thousand. That would have cleared a lot of his troubles, right? And so, but you know, I didn't know it at the time. But he really needed that money, and he was pretty salty on the ride home. And I, and I never really saw that side of him. He was just really angry and frustrated. But you know, being a guy that likes to gamble, hey, I understand that. And I just thought that was, hey, just had some bad luck at the racetrack, right? But what his problem is, is his time's running out and he's, you know, we'll get to it, but his, his time's running out. He's got to come up with some serious money soon here. So there, there wasn't too much more to tip me off, but I finally started thinking this just doesn't make sense. Remember when you said you were at the bank and the bank guy said, I, I can't put my finger on it, yeah. but something's not right here. And you said, well, I'm sure it will come to you. Yeah. So I was kind of. It's just your intuition. It's just my intuition off, you know. just told me something was really off. And you know what the main thing was? He wouldn't, I didn't go in his room. And when you peeked in there, it was a pigsty. And people that do well. Normally take care of their stuff. Right. Now, I can well, they be, typically have a, you typically need to have an organized mind yes. in order to be an organized person and be able, you can fake it. Right. But you can't fake it all the time if it's just not true to your nature. Like very, very well said, Matt. His mattress looked like he hadn't washed his sheets in three years. It was that. It had like the sweat stains on right. it. Right. I'm Ugh. like, oh my gosh, that looks like a prison cell. And I'm no neat freak, but. I started yeah. rebelling from him, like making up my bed every day and, and just <laughs> trying, you the other way, you know, trying to be like, Hey, if girls ever come back here, are you going to bring one in that room? Right. And so we, we would play, have poker games at night on the weekends. There was this place called Mulvaney's, a beach bar we would go to and he would pay every time Matt. and I was like, dude, I'm not your girlfriend. Right. You know, and I grew up with a father that always picked up the check. And so it's just my nature. If I'm taking a check out, yeah, even I'm if paying. we're on the friends, I'm paying. I'm right. just paying. It's just, that's the reality. I'm paying. You know, I'm old school like that. It's just what it is. So, and it just, I just remember thinking, this is weird. So one Saturday, I'm at home. Mail goes through the slot. And it's his Bank of America statement. I opened it. <laughs> <laughs> totally inappropriate. But anyway, what is that? You, uh, you know what? Looks you, and I feel bad. I feel bad. <laughs> Nobody feels worse about this than me. But that fucker was thick. <laughs> I, I, I did feel bad. But he's got my, my buddy Matt money for 30 grand. 30 grand. And Matt just told me, I'm giving him another 15. And I'm like, I don't know, dude. Hold off. Make sure these yeah. first couple deals go through. You know, what are you giving him more money for? Right. So I opened up his, and I figured, hey, I'm a little sketchy myself. I'll glue it back together, make it look good like it wasn't it open. Yeah. yeah. Or it didn't it? show up. Yeah. Yeah. I've well, done you, that you're missing. Yeah. I've, 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 I have a couple things not show up here, too. Yeah. Mom and dad's credit card when you're a kid. Oh. This must must statement that goes bye bye right. right yeah kids don't do that but so I looked he got the money from Matt it didn't go to the bank it would withdraw 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 right but I didn't say anything to him because I thought how would I know maybe he and the vice president of the bank are putting one over on Matt yeah he's partners in the deal but they're pocketing their pocket profits up front right okay. so. And no so you don't know exactly how, I don't money exactly is how, like, how yeah. they made the arrangement, but I kind of know. And I remember we're in August 
and we started getting some really bad rainstorms. And there were some hurricanes in 05. There was Charlie, there was Katrina and, and Wilma later on. And my grandma wasn't staying in her place in Lighthouse Point. And I remember Dave call. I was staying up there. I, I would spend a lot of nights up there because I started seeing this chick. And it was kind of to get away from him. I'd ha- kind of had my fill with him. Mm-hmm. Now, I'll be the first to tell you, he's an amazing dude to hang out with. He's a lot of fun. Right. He's very charismatic, and that's why people like him. My buddy at AB and Amro that taught me the mortgage business, Kevin Goodnow, thought that guy's shady. There's something about him I don't like. And he's the only person in the whole office that, that thought Dave was shady. What's weird was Dave would say, I don't like that guy, Kevin. I was like, Kevin's taught me the mortgage business mm-hmm. better than anybody. And Kevin ended up getting hired on full time. That's what I'm trying to do. So, anyway, that storm, Dave asked if he could come stay with, you know, because he wanted to get rained on in our place because there was a hole. I forgot to tell you about the house, the one we live in. Right. Dave says he owns it. The, he said, you'll see the landlord show up, but he's got to deal with me. And he showed me the documents. He's buying it. The landlord's going to get rid of the wife. And he had told a bunch of people that. The, the landlord? He's going to leave his wife. Okay. And he's going to sell the, the place, the rental property. So he doesn't own it. So he doesn't own it. Okay. But he told me that he owned it. Right. He, he said, you might see the landlord right. come by and do some maintenance. But it's all a show because he's going to leave his wife soon. And I was too stupid to not figure out that that was just a, a garbage story. Okay, then you don't own it. You're you're just leasing it. Well, exactly. I, I don't understand. What, exactly. Okay. And you know, if Travis was here, or they might be able to say, I don't remember the exact story. He was basically the landlord was selling it out behind the wife's back, basically. Oh, okay. So he was going to buy it. He had yeah. plans like a lease, you know, with an option to buy, a lease or with an option, right. something like that. So, and I remember it was kind of weird when he stayed with me that night up in Lighthouse Point. But, you know, it was just because I think he knows that I got into his bank statement. Okay. But he's not going to approach me on it. And I was wondering if he's going to say something to me. I, w- I have no problem talking about it. Right. Because I, I would just said, oh, yeah, dude, I'm sorry. I opened it up. I didn't, you know, I don't look at anything. I just ripped it. You know, that was going to be my answer. Right. So, and I mentioned Kevin. Kevin caught me taught me everything about the mortgage business. When he got hired full time, he sat next to Travis and Avelina. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Dave introduced Travis and Avelina. They used to have another girl. I think her name was Rachel that the four of them would hang out. Unfortunately, she committed suicide. And this is a true story because there's a plaque dedicated to her down at the beach. Okay. And so those three of them would go to the bar on her birthday and, and and talk and i wasn't invited i remember thinking dang man you guys gonna leave me home but dave said we're gonna talk about rachel and so really what they were talking about was hey when were we gonna get our money back right but dave used that as an excuse but so and this was the the kind of the final nail in the coffin as far as what i was seeing with this guy now you gotta remember this guy walked into everybody hey dave people love this dude right at lunch if you go out he's picking up the tab if with you Rachel, need ride, with, with jennifer's money or with tom's yeah, money exactly or bill's money exactly and you could be a big shot i listen i was a big shot with the bank's money absolutely i'd love to that that sounds like a lot of fun uh, that, that'd be fun to have be large and in charge but, so he said, um, I remember I got a first mortgage, got a call in. It's a first. Now, what I'll do, Matt, is I'll do the whole application and then I'll be like, who wants to get a nice commission? Right. So I'm going to give it to Kevin, my buddy, Kevin Goodnow. Taught me everything right. about the mortgage business. Kevin sits right next to Travis. And Kevin's like, dude, I got, I, I can't, I got two, I'm closing two deals at once. Right. Travis, 
when, when I first, it's, a, it's closed. You just got to, you know, it's like, oh, all right. That night, Dave says to me, Travis really doesn't like you, dude. And be careful. Don't be flirting with Avelina. He's really jealous. And I'm many things, Matt. I don't flirt with other gr- dudes, gr- wives, girlfriends. That's not my thing. Right. I went to a really small high school. And I was a hopeless romantic. And I'd think this girl's cute. And then I heard Johnny talking about how he made out with her last week. And right. I was just like, Ugh, instantly. So they didn't quit making girls. There's plenty of them out there. Right. And Evelyn wasn't my type. I never flirted with her. That's just, and Dave's like, oh yeah. Well, Dave doesn't want me talking to certain people in the office. Right. The so, people that have invested with him, yeah. buying antiques for him. Yeah, that's what I would later figure out. And then he was like, I don't know what you did to pick piss off Tommy, but boy, you know, I was like, I was like, dude, he can't take a joke. I made it, but you know, it's another guy he needs to keep me away from. Right. So there was some of the things there, but you know, in the back of your mind, you're, it doesn't make sense. Right. And your conscience is telling you that, that you know, that's garbage. So I'm going to join my buddy, Billy and Kurt. We're going to go to the Jersey shore for Labor Day. All right. And like I said, I've kind of spent time away. They haven't made me full time, even though I'm either first or second in first and second mortgages or home equity lines of credit. I'm really doing well at the company there. But for whatever reason, I've not been offered a full time position. So I'm just going to take Friday off and I'll be gone Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. And I get up to Jersey Shore and I, I remember I talked to Dave on the phone and I was like, yeah, we're going to. Atlantic City is like, let me send you some money. I'm like, hey, if you're going to offer send me money and I like to gamble, I'm like, yeah, send me 500 bucks and said, let me know if you need more. Don't tell Carol. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, and, I, and I was like, okay, all right, dude. I was like, did you, did you make a big story? He's like, yeah, I, I, I hit the superfecta. The, you know, he made up some story. So and he sent me 500 bucks. And I remember thinking, man, I should have asked him for another 500 after, you know, said none. So had a great weekend in Atlantic City, went to Wildwood, just kind of, it was a, met some really cute girl from Westchester. Then I kind of lost her in the crowd as the bars closed. Like they take the drinks out of your hand at 2 a.m. And I couldn't find her. And so I remember we went and saw, uh, the hangover that weekend just a really great weekend right. with, with my college buddies and i'm thinking that was great so i fly back home and i remember i was driving down from my parents house and i can either go right to work or i can go to the house first right. and i thought i'll just go to the house first maybe change the shirt you know and i get there and you just have that feeling when you open the door, something's different. Oh, Dave has packed up all his stuff and left. And there were bedding slips all over the floor. Because in those days, just so you know, nowadays, you don't need to keep your gambling slips, your bet stubs. They track everything through player cards or online. You know, because if you, you cash over the IRS limit, you might have to pay taxes on it. Right. So Dave had serious IRS troubles, I would later find. I'd find these notes from the IRS. So he was hit. I mean, he had hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of betting slips. And he's gone. And on my bed was a note. And on the kitchen counter, there was a note for Travis and Avelina. And I thought, great. What's going on, YouTube? RDAP Dan here, Federal Prison Time Consulting. Hope you guys are all having a great day. If you're seeing and hearing this right now, that means you're watching Matt Cox on Inside True Crime. 
At the end of Matt's video, there will be a link in the description where you can book a free consultation with yours truly, RDAP Dan, where we can discuss things that could potentially mitigate your circumstances to receive the best possible outcome at sentencing or even after you started your prison sentence. Prior to sentencing, we can focus on things like your personal narrative, your character reference letters, prepping you properly for the pre-sentence interview, which is going to determine a lot of what type of sentence you receive. If you've already been sentenced, we can also focus on the residential drug abuse program, how you can knock off one year off of your sentence. Also, we have the First Step Act where you can earn FSA credits while serving your sentence. For every 30 days that you program through the FSA, you can actually knock an additional 15 days off per month. These are huge benefits, and the only way you're going to find out more is by clicking on the link, booking your free consultation today. All right, guys, see you soon at the end of the video. Peace. I'm out of here. Back to you, Matt. Before I went on that vacation, Dave kind of set it all out there for me. He said, listen, as you know, my brother has an antique and stamp business. He said, the government, you know, people are doing more and more email. So their stamp business is really going down. So they sell all these odd lot stamps at a discount. What do you mean they're stamp? When you say stamp business, I thought you meant like antique stamps. Yeah, that's or what I specialty. thought too. He's saying that the government has so many, you know, they, they print so many stamps, but they can't sell them all. Okay. And then some of them, you know, they, they sell them in lots and you get seven off a roll here and and through the years, they just pile up. So, you know, you if you're going to buy them, so you can buy a, a stamps at a massive, at a discount, at a massive, you know, bulk, but you've got to take two cent stamps and three cents. You got to take whatever they give you, but you're going to get it at a massive discount. And he had said that he and his brother, they've, they've done this before. And it takes a little while to, to get your money back, but companies will buy those stamps from you because you're going to sell it at a discount to them. Right. And he said, you know, my brother's in with, you know, he's been buying so many stamps from the government. He's got inroads there. And he said, you know, you've got some friends that have some money. That's a great way to make 30% on your money. Tech. He said, and he was, uh, you know, my brother and I take a small fee. And obviously, we've got to make it good for the corporations. Or, or are they just going to buy it from the government? So we got to offer them a discount. But there's a nice spread there for a nice profit. And he pitched me that before I went on vacation. And I was like, well, show me the deal. Show me how it's done. And then if you show me the, pro you know, I right. got to see some things right. before I'm going to go talk to one of my ball player buddies or somebody I know. I'm not just going to take right. your word for it. And I think he was probably heartbroken that you I didn't, mean, that I didn't bite on that. Hand and, over 20 grand. Yeah. To well, I think he was stamps. looking like, I think he was looking for like a hundred grand. Because in the little note he left me, he said, I was hoping you'd end up being my partner. <laughs> partner? That doesn't yeah. sound like that. That's yeah. it. Yeah. And uh, he said, you know. So you, you said, you, so at that point, you were like, this is just before you went on vacation. And you were like, eh, yeah. I just can't yeah, really. Just, it sounds great. Sounds like an interesting idea. And, you know, the way, and the way he sold it is, listen, the government has made so many stamps and so many people use email now. They're never going to be able to sell all these stamps and they're still printing them, you know, these, you, you know, got the forever stamps and then you got seven cent stamps, 15%. There's such a backlog. They've got warehouses full of stamps and it's, we can, we have companies that'll buy them, but you know, they might have to piece them together, but if we can buy them for 40, 50, 60 cents in the dollar, then go to the, you know, IBM or somebody that still sends out mail, you know, and, and, and packages it up for them. Hey, yeah, they they can buy it at a discount, so it makes sense. Yeah. So the sounds deal like bullshit made, to me, but I hear, yeah, I hear you. Yeah. I hear you again. When he told me that, I'm not thinking anything, but he wants me to talk to people that I'm just not going to go. And you remember, I'm a yeah, former, I'm going to ruin your credibility. I'm a former stockbroker. I never right. asked Paul one time to manage his money, right? And that's what I do. Right. And he, when I say manage his money, I would talk about putting his money in a Schwab where he could see it online and he would just pay me quarterly because that's what I, I did at a company, Atlanta Capital Management. That's I brought all my assets to them and they paid me quarterly and I, I hadn't even pitched him on that. Right. So if I'm not, because I'm more about friendship than worrying about getting your business. Right. 
And I think they, that was kind of, so that's why I say, I wondered, did he want me to fail at work? So I'm, you know, I owe him because I'm living in his house and he's paying the rent. Right. I don't have to pay rent. And, right. Was it always and, that you were always kind of, he was always, you were always being set up for. It, yeah. Just, and he wrote in this note to me that I was hoping you'd be my partner. And I, I tried to get you. So you opened the letter. So yeah. you got back, you got the letter, you I opened the up letter, the letter. And I'm like, wow, this dude's gone. You know, I was just kind of shocked. Right. And understand, he'd lived there for six years. Right. This wasn't just some short con and all of a sudden he's gone. He had made friendships with people at work and people around the neighborhood that he had to pick up and leave on. And I know that he didn't want to leave. And he probably, you know, he didn't want to con these people out of money, but his desire for gambling money, I guess, was so much stronger. He, you know, pulled off a con here and there. And I think he just probably worked himself in a big hole. Then he came up with these other business ideas. Now you've got people that had given him money. Well, anyways, we'll get that. I drive to work and I've got to tell Travis and Avelina. Because they left, Dave left what me a did, note. What did the letter say to you? What did your letter say? It basically said, um, I'm sorry, but I got to take off. I was hoping you'd be my partner, but I don't own the house. That was BS. Okay. Uh, I didn't have a fiance that died. <sighs> uh, I got in the same problems in Ohio. And I just can't keep myself out of trouble. You're a good dude. Uh, basically, I'm sorry about Matt's money. You know, basically. My bad. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. And I'm like, and it was just, you know, I'm just. And just, we're currently, we're currently being evicted on. You yeah, might want to find someplace yeah, else to yeah. live. He's like, I'm sorry to do this to you, but I didn't pay September rent. Right. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, great. Just moving sucks in and of itself. But so that was the least of my concerns. And that, but I still don't know how much that he said, but they left a note for Travis and Aveline and I gave it to them and I heard screaming around the corner. Now I'm at work. I'm sitting at my desk. Travis is down there. Kevin's down there. And they're, Travis they're screaming. Up. They're yeah. yelling. And, and they're, but there's other people yelling. Oh, okay. So now it's spreading. And it's spreading. Right. And then the management calls me into an office and I pull out my letter. And I was like, this is what he left me. And I'm, I gave that letter up. I, th I think I made a copy of it and sent it to Matt because I got to call my college roommate. Who, by the way, tells me, oh, I did send that other 15 grand to him. That's 45, right? $45,000 I've oh. given Dave. And what kills me is, dude, where's that $45,000? You're right. Did you gamble that all? Yeah. I was sitting sure. next to you the whole time. It sure didn't look like it. So, Well, I was going to say, the, the other thing is, you know, you're like, oh, he didn't want to up and leave. But you're also thinking that he has the same emotional attachments to other people that yes. you do. Yes. You know, like there's. Yeah, you and don't. You don't know that he he may have been like, whew, get get to start over on the road, baby. <laughs> like it may have been a. Well, yeah. I'm thinking that he probably had twenty grand on him when he left, okay. he was, or thirty, because he wanted to send me another five hundred bucks. If he's hurting for cash, he's not. Why gonna, are you? Yeah. Why are you? Why are you sending me money? Right. You know, because Lord knows he could. I wasn't going in on that stamp deal, and I made that. He made a pretty hard pitch at me, and I was like, "Just show me how it's done, so yeah. I can go show go me where to you're buying people. it. Show me, yeah. yes. I've got to see it. I'm not going to take anything. I didn't do any cold calling when I was a stockbroker. You know why? Because I hang up on cold callers. Right? They annoy me. So you can go. I'm Dave Will Howard, JT Marlin. You got to get a boom." I do. I got to have a relationship with you. I truly believe people do business with who they like. That's why Dave Sreal was able to get absconded all that money because people liked him. You know what? So, so you know what's so funny is that when I was in Tampa and on the run, 
and I was flipping properties and people saw, you know, I'm like, I'm always paying for everything. I'm always, you know, how many people would come to me and say, Hey, listen, I could, you know, if I gave you 20 grand, like, like, could I, you know, what, what could I get back? And I would be like, (laughs) yeah, you know, and this is the thing, like, you know, it it was like, like one, I'm not going to rip you off, but two, I know that everything I'm doing is illegal. Right. And I don't want to have wires from you coming to me. And then the other thing was, it was like, okay, it's not worth it. You lend me for you to lend me money. For one thing, I'm borrowing money very inexpensively from the bank. Right. I have plenty of money. Yeah. Like you're 20 grand. If I've got 300,000 in the bank and I've got your 20 grand, means like what nothing, am I getting? Really means nothing really grand scheme of things. I'm borrowing money at 6%, 5%. Yeah. I don't like, what are you going to get? You're, you're just one more phone call headache that I got to worry about. Right. Like, like you're 20 grand. I can just pull 20 grand out of my own bank account and it costs me nothing. Right. You're saying, if I give you 20, would you give me back 2,200 you know, or 20,000 and give me plus 2,000? Like, no. Yeah. I tell you what, you're a better man than me. But people are constantly offering me yeah. money. Yeah. And it's like, it's crazy. It's like, this is, this is not, and I think it's the same thing. Your buddy realized I'm paying for everything. I look like I'm doing well. Everybody likes me. Everybody trusts me. Mm-hmm. They're going to offer me money. And if I come to them and ask them for money, they're going to give me the money. Oh, yeah. And, you know, he created the fear of loss, you know, like. And if you don't have it, don't matter, but I got to get it by, by Monday, you know, and right. And you know, he's always had cash on him. You know, I, I had a buddy in prison who said, remember he said, people are more concerned about losing out on a good deal than they are at, at protecting their, their, invest, their money. Yeah. They, they, they don't, what they don't want, they don't want to have a hundred thousand dollars. And find out that they could have lent it to you yep. and made 150, then to keep their 100,000, even though it's a risk, like right. they, they're more right. willing to risk it than, than, than protect it. Right. And he was like, and that was the big thing was he, he played up on that. Yep. You right. know, I've right. got this guy invested, this guy invested, this guy invested. I've got one more spot, um, but I'm talking to somebody else. Yeah. And they, oh, I, I'll do it. It's like, they're not asking me any questions. They don't have any proof. They don't have anything. They just don't want somebody else to get their investment. When we did my family's business, we did club sales. Public or quasi-private golf country clubs would turn private. And it was a deposit membership. So when you resign your membership, you get all your money back. It's a, a liability, not a, a credit for the club. My dad came up with it. It was a great program. Some country clubs, you join, pay a hundred grand, you leave, you get twenty grand, if that, if you're lucky. So it was a deposit membership, but they would have price increases, and people would be waiting there and be like, "Hey, July first, the price goes from twenty five thousand to thirty five thousand." And most of these people are really wealthy, and they're like, "I don't know, hey, that's fine, but if you want to play golf at the club." It's thirty. It will be thirty five thousand. It's twenty five right now. Right. So fear of loss is a big thing. And I love what you said in your other video. You make that sales pitch and you shut up. All right. You, my dad told me the same thing. Your dad said. Yeah. Next you'll person that spot speaks loses. Yeah. You'll talk yourself out of a deal. You'll t- oh, and then we had a problem with guys that would keep talking. Like, dude, you've already sold them on it. Shut up. So, anyway, it's screaming at the office. Screaming at the office. And uh. And and people kept coming up. Did Dave Thrill really leave? And I'm just sitting at my deck. I'm like trying to do the second mortgage. Like, <laughs> y- y- yeah, give me ten minutes. I'll, I'll I'll tell you all about it. And then the vice president comes over and said, uh, "Dave, you know, know me from Adam. Can I have a word with you?" Because <laughs> do you know what happened to my hundred thousand dollars? <laughs> well, oh my god! What's crazy was how did it keep getting worse? How, how and worse? Yeah, how Dave sold me. On the to, to sell it to Matt was he was doing what was called Six Sigma. It was some type of club. I'd never heard of it, but I would see him sit down with the vice presidents of the bank. Now I shouldn't say the bank, the mortgage company, but this was the major call center for you know a, a Dutch based company that owns LaSalle Bank and some of the other banks in the United States. So it's a pretty big deal. It's like the fourth, the fifth largest bank in the world, and he's. I would see Dave have meetings with these vice presidents. So I knew, you know, he was kind of a, a big wig, maybe not at work, but reputation wise. 
So it didn't shock me that he would talk to maybe a vice president and say, hey, let's sell some of these foreclosures. Right. Hey, greed is what runs society. Even if it wasn't on the up and up, that didn't bother me about that deal with my friend Matt. Right. You know what I'm saying? What I really didn't, you know, I'm thinking, well, oh, they can sell for it. It's their properties. And if the guy's the head of the real estate division or has control of that, why can't they sell some? Obviously, it was a scam, but it was on AB and AMRO letterhead. Right. And my friend Matt was able to get his money back, but nice. not the people in the office. Travis and Avelina. What they lose? Lost $35,000 to Dave. Now, what Dave would do, and if you go on DaveStrails.com, there's what's called a, he would write a Cognovic note. I've never heard the term Cognovic. Okay. But I think psychologically, nobody else had. Instead of <laughs> is saying, this a made up word? I owe Matt Cox 35000 but a Cognovic note. It kind of made it more official. You know what I'm saying? It's Latin. Yeah, exactly. Means, Meaning, I'm fuck you out of your money. <laughs> I mean, you're, yeah, hold on to your wallet. And so, and there was a guy that lost five, another guy lost two. And they are, like, some people were like, I had a girl tell me I loaned him $2,000 last month. Said he pitched me on some stamp deal. My husband, I said, no, I'm not even going to say anything because there were people. That, that really lost a lot of money. So in the note that he leaves to Travis and Avelina. In, in the end, like, what do you think he got the office in general? Over for? 300, oh, oh, close to $400,000. Just people in that office. Okay. And in the note he leaves to Avelina, he's like, you have the ring that I gave to my <laughs> fake ass fiance. Cut the shit, bro. And you know what you know? bothers me? Is he's writing this. <laughs> he's thinking that people are going to miss him. They want their money. Right. But That's he's still funny. in his mind. He's sentimental. He's writing a goodbye note. And you can read it on DaveSrail.com. It's called letters section. And he's like, I'm going to New York. He said, I'm, I'd commit suicide, but in my health life insurance policy, it's not covered. What? Like he feels so bad oh, about I what he's suicide done. So you guys could get your money, get your back. money back, but it doesn't well, do it cover. anyway. Let's try. <laughs> <laughs> I'm willing to risk it. Yeah. Let's, let's, well, make it look fishy. Yeah. yeah. Let's, let's make it look fishy. Well, yeah. we'll just throw a gun by and then put someone else's prints on it. So. Yeah. Well, you yeah. but we'll make it look like a hit and run. Yeah. Go out in the road. Yeah, sure. We could, I'll we run could. you over with the car. Right. Let's get that money. Yeah. yeah. Let's do the right thing. My vehicle. Do the right thing. Okay. Careless driving. 50 miles right over the embankment. Right. It'll be a hit and run. It's accidental death. Your insurance problem. We'll be whole and we'll thank you for that. Yes. Yes. So it's just, just people helping people. It's just the right thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. Do the right thing, Dave. Off yourself. So in his note, he kind of lists in there, you know, sorry, I did this to you because, but your heart picked the right friends. Don't let this incident think that you, you know, if I, you these people had to be going, I was friends with this guy for five years. The lady puts a picture of him in there saying, this man was in my house last Thanksgiving. So Avelina's mother makes a whole website, Dave Srail, the con man. And you, and I remember my friend, Matt was, oh, did you tell her you're coming on here? I'm sorry. No, I, I told Kevin, I don't, okay. I don't know Avelina's. <laughs> phone number but i told my we friend kevin the, we gotta put yeah. the website in the description oh yeah. right the yeah one? yeah one? yes it did yeah. okay and and so they put the website out because they're pissed yeah they want this sucker caught because they went to the police and the police said oh it's civil yeah and that really bothers yeah. me it bothers me that, that, because i've heard that many times because it's it's fraud like it's, it's, it's not civil. And think about this, Matt. I would call Ken Srail, Dave's brother, just to get some background. And he would tell me that, yeah, it was an insurance company. I think it was State Farm. I'm not positive. He did the same thing seven or eight years earlier. That's why he had to leave Cleveland. And his mom and dad paid his debts to make people whole. And so he left with his tail between his legs and went to Florida and started over. 
and start over. And so he ends he, up doing the same thing. And Ken said, you know what's funny? Is Avelina would end up calling, getting the number for Ken's, but Dave happened to walk by. And, he, and Ken said, yeah, tell Dave I said hi. And she, I guess she was embarrassed because she was, she wanted to find out where her money was, so she's going to call the brother because Dave acts like Ken's in on it. Yeah, him. yeah. And he said, "Yeah, tell Dave to call me." And so Ken said, "Yeah, I was wondering if he was up to his old tricks because I was getting weird emails to my website." But what Dave ended up doing was copying Ken on emails, but making up a Ken his own Ken Frail that he could, you know, anybody can start a new. Right, right. My brother's there. Ken Srail, uh, Ken Srail 11 at yahoo.com. And that comes to me. I set the web, the email up. And so that's what he was doing them. These people were pissed. So I don't understand. There was no brother. There was, there a, was brother. a brother. There was the brother didn't know anything about what okay. Dave was doing. Okay. The brother. Well, yeah, I didn't. I pissed, assume, I assume the brother knew pissed nothing. pissed that his brother's done this all over again and hurt more people. And so I ended up talking to Ken, super nice guy. And I, you know, I'm like, I just live with this brother. I was like, your brother's a good guy. If he just would put his tent, he's like, my brother's a smart guy. He just he's can't just help scumbag. himself. He's just a scumbag. He just, he just can't get over that. And you got to figure, they didn't give the stamp deal is what he, I think he sold all the people in the office on. That didn't happen two years ago. That was recent. So he was actually doing good. But something happened along the way where he started getting in more debt. And I don't understand just, you're saying this. What stamp deal? So there, there is no so stamp the, deal. No, That's the, not a real thing. But the con was real. What I'm saying is he'd been at that office for five years. So he just recently got recently himself, got in, in got trouble. himself into trouble. So you don't think it was set up for five That's years? That's why it's I just, think this guy, he said, Let, this guy's got some rich friends. And maybe he can help me because I'll... We'll rip these people off so I can make the people at work whole. Right. You know? And it's important that I keep him in the dark about what's happening yes, with all these other exactly. people. He's thinking he's going to gamble his way out yeah, of it. He's going to. Yeah. Okay. Because like I said, that one day when he missed that pick six, he just was devastated. And I've seen him. Everybody loses photo finishes, but he was devastated. Cause he's, I mean, because I imagine he probably told him, hey, it's going to take three, four months to unload all the money. But after three, four months. They were like, where's our money, dude? We gave you the money back in December of last year. Well, you it's know? hard to move antiques. Yeah, you know, or you know, stamp. or hey, stamps, man, you know. We're it's trying a- to get the companies. We got to get all the stamps. We got to get them lotted together and store. You know, it's a, but I think he ran out of excuses. But here's another thing that bothers me about the whole civil and criminal. These people were dealing with somebody at a bank, the fifth largest bank in the world, you right. would have thought they did a background check on him. Right. On their own employees. Well, are you saying he had been locked up before or he'd had, well, it was written. I think it was in the paper about his shenanigans in Ohio. Okay. So I don't know if he'd been arrested or not, but I'll call previous employers. Well, I mean, well, I mean maybe, maybe they just, did a criminal background check. Nothing came up. They're good. Okay. Keep going. That, okay. That makes sense. But. You know. And it's not hard to fake a, a resume, you know? Yeah. And so yeah, who knows? That's true. So. And, and let's face it. They're not paying you anything. And it's a part time. Like they let you right. work your way up. Right. So. Right. So Srail ends up going to Texas. And the following spring, Paul, my buddy, the baseball player, lives in San Antonio. And he calls me and says, hey, you're not going to believe this. Does that guy, that guy, Dave, that you live with, does he bring a big bag of pens to the track with him and wear a bandana? I said, yeah. He's like, he's sitting three feet away from me. So Paul goes to talk to him. Dave says, I'll I'll be right back. Paul said he went to the bathroom and ran out of the racetrack. Paul's like, dude, I'm not going to turn him in. I just wanted to talk to him. Yeah. You know? So that website ends up going up and someone finds out Dave's real name. Apparently he'd been using fake names. He was doing uh, fake names once he took off. Yeah, I think his real so. name is Dave Shrill. Dave Shrill. But, but he was giving fake names and he was also signing up for like uh, Big Pharma has all these tests. Uh, uh, 
what the, what am I looking for? They're looking for volunteers on a blood uh, uh, right to take medical study. Yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying. And they pay you this much, and exactly. And he's so taking. He was doing. He's got, he's got five of them going. <laughs> all kinds of chemicals yeah. in his fucking blood. Well, when I went through his, his, when we went to his room, we we he'd done them before, and you know, and Travis and Avelina would later come to the house. Well, I I I, I kind of blown it. If you read the end of the letter he left Travis and Avelina, right after he BSs about I'm, um, you know, the suicide, yeah, yeah, poor, poor me, poor, poor me, but I'm going to use my talent for good and trust your heart, Avelina. You didn't do bad picking friends in me, and you found a great man in Travis. And at the very end there, and he said, "Oh, and as far as David, I just don't have the words." And what he means is that guy, David, and his mom that he stole $300,000 from. That was their life savings. He couldn't leave him a letter. Which one was David? There was another guy in the office. Oh, okay. I didn't know about it either until I read the letter. $300,000 he stole from a guy and his mom. I went outside the office. He was sobbing in his car. Dave was. Dave was. This guy, David. He's got to go home and, t- home and tell his mom. It, that all our money has gone. Wow. No, we can't arrest the guy for screwing. Because here's my, uh, my if thing. I, if I went into the bank and I lied to the bank mm-hmm. and they gave me money mm-hmm. and I'd never paid them up back, mm-hmm. that's fraud. Right. So because you're, t- so because you're not a licensed organization, because he borrowed money from somebody. Mm-hmm. The, they're saying, oh, that's, that's Puts civil. Puts it on this note saying, I'm just the money from you. Writes a note saying, I'm a con man. What's the And di- admits to it. Well, what, what, is, what is the difference is between me borrowing 300000 from Bank of America and then writing them a note saying, hey, my bad. I just took your money. Go fuck screw yourself. A person. It's the same thing. I still have a promissory note. So if we screw banks, you go to prison. But if we screw the Individuals, American people. Individuals, go fuck, it's, it's, yeah. go fuck yourself. Go, go find a lawyer. Now, lucky for my buddy, Matt, I found a great attorney down in Miami that was a friend of the family, and he got Matt all his money back. For how? We well, sued AB and AMRO. Okay. Because their let it was on their letterhead. It was their employees. He presented okay. it. Right, you right, know, right. He sent the appraisals. He yeah, sent yeah, the but, descriptions. But what about the other guy? 300000 Dave. No, he's nothing. Fucked. They didn't get any money. Yeah, back. You told me you got his money. I, I, I was thinking about Dave. Yeah, yeah, I feel it's terrible. That's why I'm sitting here I, because there's a big injustice. The, the people that on your adventure, I don't think what's it, what when it's all said and done, the banks they have insurance policies against fraud, right? Or at least they've built it into their business that, model. It's like, the business right. model, absolutely. Like they, there are a certain percentage of interest rates and everything else goes just towards. You fraud. said there was one guy that was really mad at you, and and really- I had th- so I actually have like four victims, um, and that but the total I owe all victims is about thirty grand, and I didn't take the money. Like you've got a doctor that paid like eleven or twelve thousand dollars to an attorney. An, to an attorney, they all, all paid for attorneys, by the way. The same thing, CPA paid for an attorney. Same thing as a lawyer mm-hmm. that lent money. Uh, he was a hard money, uh, hard money lender. He also um, paid a lawyer. Uh, he paid like twenty five, thirty five hundred. Right. Like I, you know, and then there was like one other person. It was the same thing. They paid like twenty five hundred, thirty five. The most was the doctor that lost money. And yeah, he was so furious that he couldn't be. He was like, oh, that he he couldn't even come to because they wanted him to get up and say because he'd lost the most money. He I had to hire an attorney. I this did he, he wouldn't, lose his life saving? <clears throat> no, no, he you lost, know what I'm saying. But yeah. that's my point. Yeah, and he's that mad. I know, but you know, but, some guys are. Oh, so, of course, they I'm don't like fucking, to get be get over on right. But it's just how how do we allow this to happen? Even if they don't lock Strail up and say. We're going to garnish your wages to pay these people off. Right. At least something you know, coming that, in. So they get some money back. Yeah. $500 a month. These, they're getting something, but nothing. It's just. And the thing is, if they grabbed him, mm-hmm. like how hard of a case is that to even make? Once you grab him, you say, here's, here it is. Yeah. We're charging you with this. You get on probation. You're going to start making payments. Mm-hmm. That's it. Like, like yeah. that's not a hard that, that's what I. That's my thought exactly. The police. So he goes to Texas. A guy reads DaveSrail.com. And apparently Dave had a knife on him. And the guy confronted Dave. Now, Dave's not a fighter, but he would pull the knife out, like, get away from me. 
That's the only reason he did 30 days in jail is because he pulled out a knife. Pulled a knife, the guy, the guy called the cops. Got, yeah. Dave was gone, found a new company. The, the guy talked to a detective. The detective found the website, DaveSrail.com. They arrested Srail right before he was going to get on an airplane, going to do work. He was working for some company that they used to fly off-site in Texas. But he only did like 30 or 60 days in jail. And that's it. He goes to Evansville, Indiana. He screws a lady out of a couple thousand dollars. He's repeated this. So in my mind, if we could say this guy's a scam artist, he's a perfect con man. Cons short for confidence. You right. gain confidence in him. He is a con man. Right. And if you say he did it in Ohio, he did it in Florida, he did it in Texas, he did it in Indiana. I mean, you've got a pattern from the 90s up to 2015. He's just screwing people. It just hasn't stopped. You know, what's, what's funny to me is that like he, he's getting these jobs at these financial institutions or these institutions where you have access to people's. It, that's my point. Right. Like, so like You would think they would do a little extra. Like he's got social I know you can't do number. the, you know, yeah, you check. Does he have a criminal record? But you got to be really careful. You got people's social security numbers. You got everything's yeah. there. Listen, when you're talking to somebody on the phone and you're getting their information, especially back then, back then they're giving I, it all I, to you right I, over the phone. Matt, I was talking about second mortgage with people and I'm like, you're going to have to give me your social so I can do your credit. Boom, people no don't problem. like giving social security to strangers over the phone and I don't blame them. Right. But they give it to you. They give it to you. Well, I was going to say, um, the, the thing is, is, is that like I would get on the phone with somebody and ask them all kinds of, like, so once they start telling you stuff. Right. You get them in the pop. It, it, they're all in. Like, you know, at once they get date of birth, social security number, where were you, born, what's, what state and county were you born? your mother's like, maiden name. Like, you're asking them questions. Like, like, there's no reason for me to ask you some, right. of, some of these questions. I was wondering how you did that. How yeah. do you get on a maiden name? Yeah. Let, oh, I would let's just, have a I would password just, just in case. Uh, absolutely. What's your mom's maiden name? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, just for security reasons. Just for security password. What's your mom's maiden name? Oh, okay. Oh, it's such and such. Okay, thank you. It's like, oh, are you serious? Like, I would like you could have made something up. Give yeah. me your dog's name, you know, anything. But they give that, and then listen. I would keep. I, I never had anybody who who would stop it halfway through. Right. Like as soon as they give me their social security number, you kicked in the door. Now you're in the house. Right. They're giving you everything. So the ironic thing is about. Three years later, I started getting notices from the IRS that I owed back taxes. And I thought, that's strange. Maybe <laughs> I hit a $2,000 ticket to the racetrack that I didn't claim on. Oh, no. Someone said I made $270,000 a year, was oh, got seventy grand in taxes. He used your social security? security? Someone used my social security. Who could I, that be? I thought maybe it was Dave Srail. Okay. Was it? It wasn't? It wasn't. Oh, um, that's Gonna say. But there were they let go of me at the bank because they felt like I was a distraction at work, even though I was doing a great job and I wasn't full time. I was still a temp. They never brought me over and people were coming up to me. I don't blame them. And to be honest with you, I didn't want to live that far south. You know, it'd be right. like you going down to Sarasota. It's just too far of a drive. You know, it was too far. And my, my friends were all in West Palm Beach and at Hollywood. That's a good hour and 15 minute drive. So, but I was still pissed that they, 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 they gave me my walking papers because I was the top, you know, I was writing a lot of second mortgages, but yeah, people would come up to me. Have you heard anything from Dave? I'm like, listen, you guys know him more than I do. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm you let him money. Here. Yeah. You <laughs> You're let, the one that let him money. I didn't yeah. know him well enough to lend him any money. But, but, you know, like I said earlier, I, I, Again, thinking that maybe he was just hoping that I wouldn't work out and I'd be so beholden to him because he was paying for all my meals and food that I would call my rich friends to get him in on the scam. So what happened? Um, where, where did he go? Like, have you heard? From, where is he now? So Sorry. according to the website, he's fishing up in Alaska right now. As a, as working as a out commercial like a deckhand? Fisherman. Like a deckhand? Yeah, something like that. Like Alaska uh, Sea, what are the yeah, crabbers? Deadliest, what, what catch. deadliest catch. Yeah. And let me tell you something. I, I grew up on boats. I love fishing. But A, it's way too cold. Yeah. It, it's bitter cold up there. And that is a rough job. Because 
They, yeah, they you treat do. you like shit if you're brand new going out on those boats. I was going to say, and you borrow money from those guys. You're done. Yeah. You, you get keel hauled if you do Tell that. Tell me again about those antiques. But if you've noticed, yeah, <laughs> if you know anything about Deadliest Catch, a lot of them get picked up for drugs and fraud, yeah. theft, but they can go there to make quick money. I was well, maybe hoping, that's what he's doing. Yeah. Maybe Dave's stockpiling money to, to pay, pay everybody, everybody back. back. Yeah. I, was I hoping. don't think you're giving him credit. Yeah. I was hoping. You know what? I, I hope the guy hits for a million dollars and sends that guy, David. No. I bet you if he hit for fucking 10 million, he ain't paying those I people agree. shit. I agree. And they're never was, seen a dime. I was telling Colby, it's sad because he's such a fun guy to hang out with. There's just some people. They have that magnetic personality. I know he a guy made named. me laugh. I know a guy named Red Bull loved hanging out with them. <laughs> I wouldn't lend him a dime. Yeah. I wouldn't, I, I never bought him anything that I didn't expect to absolutely not get it back. Yeah. It's like some guys I went to college with. They were great to hang out with, but you wouldn't let your sister date them. <laughs> right. That's yeah. exactly. Um, yeah. I, 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 that's an insane. I knew. So I'm going to, I, I, I think, did I, have I ever told you about Jim Keegan? All right, so I'm going to tell you a story right now because this reminded me of Jim Keegan. Jim Keegan's a guy are, um, that I met in federal prison. Jim Keegan was in federal prison for, um, for like he had embezzled some client money, right? So it was like wire fraud. No big deal, small. He got a minor sentence, maybe three years, maybe four years. And so he'd embezzled some money and, and admittedly, he, he said he did do it. He was, you know, drinking and gambling, whatever the reason was. He's like, he, and he had already paid the money back, but he, he the prosecutors, they hated him because he was a lawyer. Mm -hmm. He was a lawyer and he fought uh, criminal, uh, state criminal cases. And he'd won at trial so many times that they, that when they got him, they went to the U.S. attorney. And when they actually found this out about the, the uh, misappropriative uh, funds in his law office they just hammered him they they just wouldn't take a deal i'm trying to give him 15 years because he beat the state so many times he used to represent uh, drug dealers and and gang members and he'd gotten them off on murder charges and so they just they wanted him gone so anything even commingling funds anything that they can get they're anything, gonna get him anything and so he ends up in federal prison and he was like yeah i'm gonna get out and i'm gonna i'm gonna go to work for my brother his brother was a lawyer he's like i'm gonna go to work for my brother um and I was like, oh, are you doing any legal work here? He's like, no, I don't do any legal work here. I don't, I don't want to do any legal work um, uh, at all for anybody. And he'd come from another prison, by the way. So another, uh, he'd be a low to low transfer because he said, I want to be in Florida and this and that. And um, but people were constantly like, you were a lawyer on the street? He was like, yeah, but I did criminal law, state. I haven't done, I don't do federal. And they would come to him and can you look at my case? Can you look at my case? He got, well, look, I'll look at it. I'll, I'll look at it, but I'm not going to, I can't do so anything. Do inmates have their paperwork on them they for the there. most part? Uh, no, no. For the most part, they don't. For the most part, they get their sentence. They just don't okay. do anything. All right. But some guys get think they, they can get over. They can get something right. off, get some time knocked off. They gave me an enhancement for a gun I didn't have. They gave me 10 years. So it's worth fighting. If you can get sure. the enhancement off, you got 15 years. You 10 knocks off. You've already done two. You got five years. You know, you got a five-year sentence. Plus gain time, like you could be going to halfway house if you win that, right. that enhancement. Right. And and so Keegan was like, okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, yeah, I'll take a look at your stuff. And he'd look at it and he'd go, look, I mean, I looked at it. Um, I talked to my brother about it. He came to see me and he did have a brother who owned a law firm in Orlando. And he said, I talked to my brother about it. Like, you probably have a good case. My brother doesn't do, we, we both do state. Uh, he does more civil than I, I, I did. So, yeah. And so people would he, and he would tell people like, look, you know, I do. You can have your family look me up and they would look him up. And sure enough, this dude was in the paper all the fucking time. Jim Keegan just won this murder trial, this murder trial. Like you could literally there were probably eight different articles about him winning murder. I mean, going for murder, winning the wow. cases. Now, by the way, winning a murder case is one of the easiest cases. Murder is one of the hardest thing to prove. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because so, a reasonable doubt, you know, you don't want to put some, you'd rather let a guilty man walk free than lock up an innocent man. Right. Like it's not, and, and, and let's face it, a lot of times it's super circumstantial. Like mm -hmm. you're dead. Mm -hmm. 
and you know you're dead and then you really it's, it's up to the prosecutor to prove that i was there that i did like if, that, you know there's a lot, it, like listen, there's no witness it's so scary you could literally go and pick something up a hat that you might like and then a person that's a victim buys that hat takes it home and with touch DNA now. Right. They uh, put you together Matthew with the Cox, guy. So your DNA was found in this murder. You're like, right. no, I just picked that. Right. That, but let's say that, that that's one of those things that he would just go to. There's weird circumstantial things that just happen in life. And that, that gets very scary. There's a right. lot of people that have been locked up that were innocent. And now right. DNA is proving them innocent. Right. Well, that's something totally different. What we're talking about is that this guy got him off on murder. Like oh, he was sure. getting off people on murder. Sure. So they didn't like him. They sent him to prison. Um. So here's what I'm saying is that people, because he didn't want to do legal work, people are constantly coming to him, begging him to do legal work because they're looking at he's a lawyer and he's great. He's a he great does. lawyer. And because they're looking at the newspaper, they see that he's been super successful. So his mm -hmm. story makes sense. People start giving him money like, bro. He's like, look, honestly, I can't. I mean, he's like, look, I, I'll do your case for you. I'm going to work, but I'm, I'm leaving here in like eight months to a year. Right. I'll be in the halfway house and I'm going to be working at my brother's law office. Right. You can have your family look up my brother too. They would look him up. Sure enough, there's a law office. His brother's name is like whatever, mm -hmm. Bill Keegan or right. Tom Keegan. And they're like, oh, wow. Like it's a pretty odd name. Right. And so, and it, the people would see his brother come. He would also sometimes call his brother and say, can you pull this guy's docket sheet? So think about it. I can order my docket sheet, but it's going to mm -hmm. take me two weeks to get it. Maybe three weeks. But he would say, well, what, give me your docket number or your, your criminal number. Okay. And then he'd come back two hours later and he'd have a printout where his brother pulled it. Like, you're like, wow, he really works at a fucking law firm. So you know, this is his brother. This guy's connected. He could get research done. So he would say, look, I'll take your case. But honestly, man, it's like $3,500. I, mean, I, I can't charge you. Well, I, you're, in, you're, in, you're in prison. Right. So, you know, like I can work on it. And if I don't finish it by the time I... By the time I leave, I'll be at my brother, my brother's law office. So I'll finish it while I'm there. So guys are like going to their parents, going to their family, coming up with the $3,500. They're putting it on his books or, or he'd say, send it to my brother. They're sending it to his brother, his brother's cat, you know, personal, not to his, to the law firm, but they're sending him 1500 bucks. Like, Hey, give him, put a thousand in my books, send my brother 1500, that's 2,500 or whatever. So he, he, he's, even though he's like, no, 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 mm -hmm. they're begging to, to give him money, begging to, their families are coming up with the money. This guy stockpiles, I don't know what it was, twenty thirty thousand dollars $30,000 within the last few months. Right. He gets out of prison. He goes to the halfway house. Nobody hears from him. People start worrying. He's got my legal work. He's we he was filing motions. My family gave him thirty five hundred. My family gave him twenty five hundred. My family. I bought this guy two thousand dollars worth of commissary. I I put money on this guy's books and this guy. He's got money sent it, being sent everywhere. But he's explained that look, it's gonna. I gotta get out. I gotta this. People start calling his brother's law firm. Mm -hmm. His brother is like, my brother's not a lawyer. My brother's a fucking con man. What are you talking about? My brother went to jail. Because he was doing the books for somebody and he was embezzling money from their business. And that's why he went to jail. And he's been to jail before. And they're like, no, well, my family looked him up. He was in the Chicago Tribune. Like, no, no, my brother's name is Jim Keegan. My father's name is Jim, Jim Keegan. Keegan. My father was a big time attorney. Yep. And he's like, do the math, bro. Yeah. My brother, my brother's 1984 story. Do you right. think it's me? Yeah, right. My brother's 50. He would have been 23 years old when he tried that yeah. case. He would have been 28 years old. Like, are you like, the look con at the just came to him. They keep him cupped ass. And right. Like I can build these people. Look at the photos. Yeah. He's like, look at the photos. That's my dad. Of course, the person at the person at home looking up the per doesn't realize that you're not. They don't see what Jim Keegan looks like. Like this guy would be 70 something. Yeah. Jim Keegan's 50. Like, it, you know, so it's like, it's like, holy shit. Listen, it was, and I hate to say this, but it was hilarious. That is hilarious. And, and so what happened, and this is what's even more funny. And this is the only reason it reminds me of what you said. Right. I had a literary agent at the time. And I remember telling the literary agent, like, holy shit, you're not going to fucking, like, I was telling him about it, the whole thing, right? Um, and he, so he knew about it. 
So what happens is it turns out that a lot of these people started, their family started writing letters to the bar saying, I gave this lawyer yeah. money for his brother who was in prison and I gave him money. So his brother starts just paying people back yeah. because the, the, they're saying the bar is like saying first they, the, what they say is we don't get involved in legal fee disputes. Right. But they also are writing letters to him saying you have to answer this. So he's scared. He starts cutting checks for thirty five hundred, twenty five hundred, fifteen hundred, right. thirty five hundred. I even ha knew a guy that wrote a letter to him saying I gave your brother fifteen hundred bucks. Yeah. And he cut his he, cut it, him a check. Cut he him a check. Him he didn't give a shit. He pays out like twenty something thousand wow. dollars. And keep in mind too, these are some of these people have had some motions filed, so they're in the middle of a fucking legal a, yeah. a, a legal battle with the government now that they're uh, it, they're ill equipped to even handle. Yeah. Well, my, it, here's my question on that though. This guy, even if he was a lawyer, he's great at getting. Up. Aren't we at the appeal process, and that's a special? No, 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 no. no, no. Basically, most 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 inmates. So you get arrested, you get sentenced, you have you basically have one year to file what's called a twenty two fifty five to say the government fucked up somehow, or your lawyer didn't represent you, yeah. or something. After one year, you're basically doomed. The um, now, if 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 things if there's new precedents in your case, yeah. and you can get back in court somehow, you can file a motion. Or you can try and get around the one year time bar. It's called equitable tolling by making an argument. And listen, if you don't know any better, here's the worst thing about the, the law is that you could file a nice guy motion. Do you know what a nice guy motion is? No. A nice guy is Dave's a nice guy. You should let him out of jail. And you could write it in green crown mm -hmm. and send it into the federal court and they would answer it. Like it was a legitimate thing. They'd say, uh, you know, we are we are currently uh, replying to the nice guy motion filed by uh, by Dave uh, <laughs> stating that he is a nice guy and should be let out of jail uh, uh, under, you know, under Johnson uh, versus the United States. Mm -hmm. it, it is clear that he is time barred. And th they would they wouldn't be like, is this a joke? They would act like so I could not know anything. And there are guys in right now in federal prison who act like they're jailhouse lawyers. And they'll file motion. They'll take, give me $500. They'll file motions with you. And if you don't know anything about the law, you think. They do. And they don't know shit. And the court responds oh, like it's a legitimate gosh. argument. So you have no clue. But put that aside. So here's the second thing. Part of that is that one day my, my literary agent comes to see me. I want to say he was in person. He might have just called me on the phone. We might've been, I might have just talked to him on the phone. But he said, listen, Matt, he said, do you know a guy named Jim Keegan? And I said, yeah. Why? I said, remember, I told you about him. And, then, and he goes, OK. He said, I, I thought it might be him. He goes, listen to this. He said, I went into a bar in Orlando. I was visiting a buddy who owns a bar in Orlando. He said, I happen to be in Orlando for some other reason, because this guy was actually from like Clearwater or something. So he so my literary agent went to Orlando for some reason, goes to a visit a a buddy who owns a bar goes into the bar. And while he's in the bar, he's sitting there talking to um, he's talking to the bartender and something came up where he ended up. He ended up saying something and Jim Keegan was there and Keegan said to him, and I forget exactly how it, but he ended up saying Reback because the guy's last name was Reback. He's like Reback. He goes, it's funny. He said, I got a buddy who, who has a lawyer named Reback. And he goes, oh, that's an odd name. Like people, that's a very, you know, and he said, really? He said, who's your buddy? He goes, oh, he's a, he's a writer. He's a, he's named Matt Cox. And he goes, yeah. He said, I, I'm Ross Reback. He goes, Matt Cox is a client of mine. He goes, I'm not a lawyer though. He said, I'm a literary agent mm -hmm. or I'm his agent. He said, yeah, he's in prison. He said, how do you know him? And he looked at him and you got to think that's not the, expect, you know, yeah. he looked at him and he went, oh, um, I had, I actually did some legal work for him. And he said, oh, you did? And he goes, yeah, yeah, I did. He said, oh, what's your name? He said, oh, my name's, uh, he said, oh, it, it's Jim. He said, you know what? I'll get you a business card. Hold on a second. Goes to his girlfriend, who because he was sitting with some woman. Mm -hmm. And so Ross turns to his buddy who owns the bar and says, um, oh, you know him? He goes, yeah, he comes in here all the time with us. He comes in here probably two, three times a week. With They, they live around his girlfriend. 
she's got a bunch of money. She it was, it was a very nice neighborhood. Right. Yeah, she lives around here. They come in all the time. He goes, oh, okay. He said, well, he walked outside. He said, about a minute later, the girl gets up and walks outside. And he said, five minutes go by, 10 minutes go by, 15. He walks outside. He's like, the guy that they had pulled up in like a Mercedes, it's gone. And he turns around and he goes, what's that guy's name? He goes, he said, Jim. What's his name? And he goes, well, he paid with uh, uh, his credit card. Hold on. He pulls out his slip and he goes, Jim Keegan, or, you know, Jim Keegan. And he's like, okay, cool. Oh, uh, yeah. And so he, so then when I talked to Ross, Ross goes, do you know a guy named Jim Keegan? And I was like, yeah, this is the guy. He was like, fuck, I knew it was the guy. I knew it. Yeah. He said, this is what happened. And he yeah. tells me the whole thing. Wow. And I was like, holy shit. And I, I said, yeah, bro, you're, you're never going to see him again. He said, I know I'm not. He said, that had been weeks and weeks. He said, my buddy said he came in three times a week at least. Sure. He said it had been two weeks. He'd never come back in. You know, it's funny. It's bolted. It's, I, Paul heard that after he left to go to spring training, Srail showed up at Rotama Racetrack, but he didn't want no Laduca around. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He told you bolted. He, he, yeah. So, but, but what I was going to say is Keegan, by the way, if you look it up, got, he was on probation, got rearrested because he then opened up a, he opened up a, um, Opened up a, a whatever an office, a law office, saying that he was filing claims for. He was an immigration lawyer wow. taking money for immigrate. He was charging fifteen hundred to thirty five hundred dollars. That's big money for immigrant to file immigration papers. That's big money, yeah. And he had he he borrowed something like half a million dollars wow. in about, or he got like half a million dollars in like less than less than a year, and was actually here's the really funny part. Was giving so after a certain period of time, he was actually. I want to say it was more than that. It actually says it in the article. I ought to pull up that article. He was actually giving out green card, like the cards. <laughs> he actually started making fake oh, cards. Gosh. And so guys are coming in. I gave you. I got it. Here's your card. Yo, your card oh. came in here. Now you're off doing your thing. Yeah. So some of these guys get caught and start a whole investigation, and that's how he got grabbed that time. Goes back to jail again. Did got 10 years, got out on COVID or something. Well, he kept the same. You would think no. he'd close his office. No, after no, a this while. is another one. Yeah, oh, yeah. That's what yeah. I'm saying. You think you do it for six months yeah, or three months and then bolt. bolt. I mean, especially when people start coming and complaining. Yeah. These guys aren't that smart. They they think they're smarter than everybody's yeah. an idiot. Just like your buddy. Yes, they, they, yeah. You know, you got this guy living, and you're borrowing from all these people in the same office, telling the same lie, mm -hmm. building up money. And then you, yeah. so I'm sorry, go, but go ahead. Yeah. yeah, I had a friend, you know, my friend Matt. He was bogus. The appraisals were bogus and he wanted me to pretend like he was his lawyer. And luckily I said no, because they were watching him and then he ducked. Yeah. That's a, that's a completely, that's a completely different case yeah, yeah, that you're talking yeah, about. But, but, but it's another guy that thinks he's smarter. Right. Than he really is. And you know, had he not run, he wouldn't even probably have gone to jail. But anyways, <clears throat> I don't want anybody to have pity on Dave Srail because I forgot to tell you when we were going through his bedroom, we found some, you know, girly spank magazines. He had cut out pictures of my ex fiance because we all went out one night on the town, right? And put it in place of the the pictures on the girls' bodies, and oh, was hand feeding it to my ex's picture. That's just weird. That's just wrong. I mean, <laughs> but I mean, who would go out of their way to do it? like what? Just That's like just weird. Thinking about my ex. Well, like, here's what I don't understand: is like. You said the whole time, like he never dated anybody. No. He never, like, what's like and mentally? You know what? He's not a bad looking guy. Yeah, because what's weird was when he was at work, he wore his hair really long, and it looked goofy. Because if you trim him up, he presents himself. He's six four. Right. I mean, he was a big dude. You know, was he wearing a mullet? Yeah, he kind of had a dumb looking mullet. There's two pictures. You can see both his hairstyles. He would change it when he'd go someplace else. That was probably the the South Florida hairstyle. And I'm like, Dude, we definitely... cut your hair, and then he would leave stubble and whatnot. You got to put his in, in the keywords. You have to put his his name. Yeah, like to have this come up if somebody. Yeah, how funny is that? But you know, and then when he got arrested, his hair was trimmed. He looked good. Girls liked him, but but he would play the. Yeah, it's just my Jen, man. I can't get her out of my head. And listen, I was like, oh. To me, that that story would that would 
get you laid more than anything. Of Women course. would want. I mean, right? So why not play up? That's what I'm saying. If you're gonna if you're gonna create this bullshit, like why yeah, not take exactly. the benefit? I mean, you either <laughs> he just have no game. That's why. That's why I was wondering if he was maybe a little. Uh, he likes show tunes, Matt. You know, I was I kind mean, of like mentally. I wonder what's wrong with you know. But why is he cutting pictures out of he's my a, old girlfriend and weirdo. putting in place and ah. Uh, it was, oh man! All right, my mother's gonna listen to this. Like, I can't believe he did that, Korea. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my story of living a con with a con man for six months and seeing the whole thing unfold. And unfortunately, thirty he, days for he, a knife. He really ruined a couple families' lives, right? And there's I mean, who knows how much damage he's really done. Really like, those done. are the things that are that are are extremely obvious that you've come across. Who yeah. knows how many little tiny things. And, and we would later find out he did the same thing in Ohio for well over a hundred thousand dollars. And he just re kept repeating the process wherever he went. And the government says, that's a civil matter. But if you steal from a bank, we're going to throw you in prison. Right. I mean, psh, that's, it's got me, got my mind get going, you know what I'm yeah. saying? It's got the gears going, but. But yeah, it's just it just seems very unfair. Listen, if I did that, if I clip somebody for two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand, they would say it's fraud. Yeah, of course. you're going to prison, of course, because just because they're like, yeah, it's you. Yeah, I wouldn't have old Dave's uh, luck. Yeah, yeah. You, I mean, you might be right, but it just doesn't make sense. It's 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 sad. The, 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 the it real really sad thing sad. is, even if they went and arrested the guy. Uh, yeah, they're never going to get anything. You, like he's well, he's going to make restitution payments. Keep them out of prison. Make them work to pay it off. Right, yeah. Because that's what the people need right. is money. Don't send them to jail. Well, first of all, mentally, like this, th there are some people that no matter what you do, they're going to they're gonna run some kind of con. I mean, obviously, he's, a ga he's, he's um, addicted to gambling. Yes. He's like, but you said he wasn't bad at it. But no. then you said he lost hundreds of thousand dollars. But that's the whole thing. When he was really a great handicapper, such the fact that Thistle Downs hired him as their on track handicapper. And he did the, the, the TV show. He showed me tapes of it. This wasn't him saying, I saw it with my own eyes. He did a TV show. Thistle Downs, a little track in Ohio. But Dave was really a good handicapper. And if he set his mind to it and he managed his money right, you know. They don't build these tracks on people winning. They build on people losing. But there are some guys that, you know, if you pick your spots, but Dave couldn't control himself. So, like when I told the story about him being at the High Life Fronton, he's betting Australia at 8 o'clock in the morning. That's what he was doing. Right. If he would have just kept his gambling just to the weekends, probably, maybe he wouldn't have lost so much. But this guy's just got to have action. And I think that was his ultimate undoing. The sad thing was he lived in the straight and narrow probably four or five years. And it was that last year down here in Florida that it really got it to like him. like being an alcoholic. Like, yeah, you know, they've they been sure. great for five years and Absolutely. then they have one six months there. They've lost everything. Yeah. Yeah. So. And, and the, uh, the, yeah, he just, I think, but you know, Gambling such an issue, and if, especially if you're competitive, when you lose, you want to get back up and go right back at it. Right. And so you get, you're more engaged, more engaged. Is that you? Yeah, it must be the people showing up to fix the AC. <laughs> you want to take it? Speaking of marriage, though. What? Grail. What? So the, if the ex-fiance is fake. Right. And didn't have any chicks down there. So if the ex-fiance is fake and didn't go after any chick, apparently he and Avelina dated very briefly. Was he afraid to bring a woman into his con? I, I have no you know, idea. I, I, you know, I dated a chick that I remember she had told me that she dated a guy. Because I remember we, we had gone on a few dates. Th this was 20 years ago. Right. I remember we had gone on, on like, a, like one date or two dates. And I remember she was like, like it, we had slept together and she, she said, she goes, do you have any fetishes? And I was like, well, what do you mean? And she goes, 
she said, I just want to make sure that you're just like a normal, like there's nothing weird. And I was like, why? I was like, have you dated some guys that have some weird stuff? She goes, yeah. She goes, I dated a guy that literally, she said he had like a feet fetish. Oh, and I was like, are you, she was like, like he literally wanted me to lube up my feet and he would, it's, she was, it, it was weird. And I was like, Oh wow! I said, "How long did you date him?" She's like, "About six months." I was like, six months! <laughs> six months! Like, oh my god! Wow! You and I were on Match. dot com about at the same time, and I remember I used to go to Tampa, Orlando, meet some girls. That Becky How, but yeah. I didn't run to her. Because let me tell you something: you're a better man than me. She would have been hog tied, duct tape. I would have taken more than half of the money and said, "Here you go, honey. I'm out of here." You, you, I, yeah, that's when not. You said you, you're a good man. I, you, you left her with a bunch of money. She, I tell you what, she didn't, she didn't last. She lasted about a year. That, that's the type of woman that I would date thinking, oh, I feel bad for her. She's bipolar. And then next thing you know, I'm, you know, wondering, what am I doing? Oh, listen, I thought it all the time. She, <laughs> she, she had me too. She had me like, you know, she'd cry. They he'd, cry. That's I'm a sucker for a girl yeah, that cries. Crying and I, uh, I feel bad. And 